but uh, Good don't evening. Use it. Welcome to the Select Board meeting. Today is December 3rd, 2019. We're airing on Comcast Channel 22 and Verizon Channel 33. Uh, tonight's agenda will have liaison reports, town manager report, and public comment. Uh, we have a hearing to have a name change of our CASA. Um, We'll be appointing a board of registrar. We have some licenses and liquor licenses for approval. Uh, we also will be approving a pledge of collateral from Liquor Junction. We'll have a presentation from the facilities department on past and future energy improvements. Uh, an update from HR on employee retention and attraction. A hearing from PTTTF. And then we'll move on to future agendas and minutes. So why don't we start with liaison reports. Andy, I'll start with you. Okay. I have Thanks, Vanessa. I have three items. Forgive me for reading them. Um, the first is about dementia-friendly reading. Um, prior to our last meeting, the board received an email from Brian Snell asking us to support and acknowledge the efforts of dementia-friendly reading, uh, a group dedicated to make reading, reading to making reading a more dementia-friendly community. <coughs> uh, I'm wondering if if any one of us has followed up on this request specifically regarding um, the board acknowledging uh, dementia friendly reading perhaps through a proclamation or something so I know we're working through our communications policy but um, uh, has anyone uh, anyway so you can answer during your report if not um, I'd be happy to work on it um, the other thing is an update on the uh, independent gas leak article that town meeting was generous enough to approve um, I spoke to David Zeke I've been speaking to David Zeke about the uh, independent audit and um, the plan as was explained at town meeting is to hire a consultant to complete complete a phase one um, which is a driving survey along roadways to find gas leaks then the data that data will be then uh, used to develop uh, a plan for phase Two, David's recommendation is that he and I set up a meeting with the town manager and uh, and the consultant Bob Ackley, which David can tell you more about, or I could, to discuss the phase one. The cost of which would be about five thousand um, dollars. David did say he preferred I attend this meeting. Um, as someone with a strong background in sciences and environmental testing, um, I'd like to ask the board's permission to uh, continue to stay involved in this, both in the planning and execution, execution uh, of phases one and two, as well as uh, continue to represent the board in the multi-town gas leak initiative. So something to, to chew on there. Um, the Met. Um, the development across from the train station is a 40B building um, located at the, uh, across Lincoln Street from the, from the depot. As you know, the developer the developer was recently cited with two violations of the uh, comprehensive permit. The violations pertaining to lighting fixtures in the garage. Uh, the, I'm sorry, the violations pertain to lighting fixtures in the garage and uh, paving of an area that was um, dedicated to landscaping, including trees that would buffer uh, the building from an abutting residence. Uh, yesterday, I forwarded to the board, you've all seen it, um, an email from a resident that was sent on November 26 to the planning department. Uh, the resident asks if a number of other permit requirements will be addressed, including snow removal, because the, the building now hangs a little bit over the farther out over the sidewalk than they had originally planned. Um, the clear dark and the clear demarcation of a loading zone and others. It's a long, comprehensive permit. Um, Bob uh, sent you the assistant town manager's, manager's response, uh, stating that the building commissioner is withholding the final certificate of occupancy until he is satisfied that the project complies with the comprehensive permit. Um, to clarify, the certificate of ox occupancy will be withheld until the applicant either complies with the existing permit or obtains a variance from the ZBA. Um, the, given the history of this development, um, 
to which I'm the liaison vis-a-vis -vis the permit, I asked the assistant town manager if the town could either require either um, a certification from the civil engineer, architect, and general contractor that describes all the changes to the comp permit, or uh, a certified copy of the as-built plans that can be compared to the plans of the comp permit. Either of these requirements, or both, would make uh, any deviations from the permit, the comprehensive permit, transparent to all, and would be similar to the planning department's procedure developed within the past year of requiring a certified plan of the concrete pour prior to allowing above ground construction. Um, and also, some of you may have noticed that the ZBA uh, does have the Met on the agenda for Wednesday night. Um, and, um, and so uh, it's, I feel it important that we, that the town understand um, what deviations uh, the, the builder has has taken from the comprehensive permit and uh, we, we're waiting for a response from the assistant town manager um, or Bob, Bob maybe you can address this um, about whether we can we can require them to give these sort of circum, uh, certificates that would make it clear uh, what um, changes from the original comp permit um, they've made or plan to make. Um, and that is it. Okay. Mark? Uh, two things. One, um, Bob, I noticed that in your, your note to us, there's the Reading Shield with a sword in hand, followed by Limpy on the other side. I'm not sure that that's the right message. <laughs> well, one of your members suggested it was. <laughs> Uh, on a more serious note, um, a lot of a lot of activities. Um, last night, the RMLD, uh, RMLB had a meeting, and there was a discussion that took place about the payment to the town of Reading uh, going forward. And the RMLB has it very much on, in their sights to resolve this issue quickly, um, soon. Uh, the RMLD had a consultant provide a report that compared other municipal utilities to look at how much uh, they're contributing back to the to their towns. Um, and we're a little bit unique because RMLD services multiple towns um, and obviously has a lot more infrastructure as a result. Um, but the net is that their report indicated uh, a number that is substantially lower than what we are accustomed to right now. And the RMLB has decided that the process that they want to follow is to uh, first have the RMLB have a discussion about making a recommendation. They'll take it to the, the Citizens Advisory Board and have the Citizens Advisory Board uh, work with the recommendation as well. And they want to come forward with the recommendation and then open the process up to more public discussion after they've done those those things. Um, and this is likely to be on an accelerated agenda. Um, I believe that the general manager of RMLD will by next week post on the website what the recommendation is um, that came from the consultant. Um, the board will separately decide what it is that they want to do, but they want to put this onto a fast track. Um, and then the public comment would be kind of after they've done those pieces. So um, that's a bit of a, a, a change, I think, from how we had envisioned. Um, but they're they're very committed to getting this done in short order. Um, the numbers that were presented aren't quite correct because the the driver for some of these changes is that RMLD would like to invest in a lot more capital, and that would increase the net assets, and that would increase part of the payment that is happening. But the decrease in payments they're suggesting is, is much stronger than that. Order of magnitude, a half a million dollars a year uh, difference. So I think that's something we'll, we'll want to um, obviously uh, participate in. Sorry to interrupt, I just want to ask a question. Did they discuss that this would perhaps change as soon as next July 1st for that fiscal year? There was no discussion of when it would go into place. Um, but it's important for us to know this winter. 
Right. So the consultant presented a five-year okay. transition period. Okay. So that the impact would would change your kind of per year. So it wouldn't be a one-year thing. Um, I don't know what the board has in mind, but the second year of our two-year agreement will be expiring in June or sooner. Um, well, I think there's one more year. So okay. I thought that next July 1st freeze was still agreed to. It, there was absolutely no discussion okay. of, of that. Thank you. Uh, and that's it. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to draw a, a fellow board member's attention to the email that Andy had forwarded from the Chair of the Board of Health, Emmy Dove, um, hmm. providing feedback to us on the feedback we had provided to them uh, on the draft pesticide regulations. So um, they're, they're not finalized yet, but they did consider the feedback we've given them and they, they have a response that they, they that Emmy provided to us by email. Um, I also, uh, this isn't exactly a liaison report, but uh, several of us uh, had the good fortune to attend on Friday uh, the dedication of the services timeless clock in memory of you know, Anthony who served on this board for 18 years. Uh, it was a, a beautiful event, it's a beautiful clock. Um, and many thanks to Megan Young and to the Reading Rotary Club for making it happen so quickly. And it's it's really lovely. It's down at the train depot, um, and you can see just on the on the face of the on two of the faces of the clock, um, it says in memory of Camille Anthony, and on the other two faces it says service time is timeless. And so you know what it's about without even having to go up to read the plaque, which is also beautifully written. Thank you. Um, so I attended the recreation meeting on November twentieth. Um, there had been a request uh, for REC to um, recommend opening up Sunday hours at Birch Meadow. Uh, that was not, both, uh, they voted against that, um, so they have not made a recommendation. I see some softball people in the audience, so we might be hearing from them in a little bit. Um, I also want to just take a moment and recognize facilities at PW for their excellent work in the snow removal in the last couple of days. Um, the roads are fantastic, yes. so thank you very much for all your hard work. Um, okay. So, Paul? Uh, I agree with you on DPW. Thanks. Um, just one quick thing and one uh, pretty important thing. The town clerk doesn't have a name tonight for the board of registrar, so the board can skip that agenda item. Um, a somewhat serious issue, uh, which does not affect your liquor renewal licenses later, is a discussion I had with the fire chief today that's been ongoing for a few weeks about occupancy limits at bars, especially restaurant bars. On the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, which is a very popular night for people returning to town and seeing their friends, uh, both the fire chief and assistant fire chief contacted a handful of spots that had a reputation for being too crowded. Um, one of them, despite that, with a capacity of 125, was reported to have about 300 people that night. A fight broke out. The police were not able to get into the establishment. God help us if that was a fire. Um, we have contacted the ABC <coughs> today. Um, we are also working with town council to see what steps the town should take or has a, a bit available to take. Um, but I was assured that even though the ABCC could get involved, it is not a, like a license renewal problem for you. But for the community, um, it's very dangerous to be in a 125 person place with 300 of you. Um, fun is fun, but that's just very dangerous. And I was really disappointed that the establishment had been warned that day and didn't do anything about it. Um, so that's all. Officer, mic on. Yeah. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. I should make a comment on that. Um, I'm glad that you brought that up, Bob. Um, I completely agree we need to look into that. The other side of that is I'm really concerned that we had two pretty substantial uh, altercations take place on that evening um, where people were hurt. And I don't know how to, we should talk about it, but we know that unfortunately that night has a reputation for having a lot of people, and it may be worth thinking about how to better what we can do to better protect everyone involved, as well as the community. Uh, Bob, if I could uh, just ask if you've had a chance to follow up, um, I assume we have 40B experts in, at, at our 
uh, disposal. If you've been able to follow up on my request for to see if we could get um, a, cert a certification from the civil engineer, etc., that describes the changes to the comp permit, so so the board is aware of them. Um, I'm at the advice of council, I'm not responding to anything until after tomorrow when ZBA holds a formal process. That was the advice I was given. So. So, let me understand, the, 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 the building, uh, or the, um, the inspector planning and uh, building inspections, building commissioner, um, they fall under, um, they, let me be clear. yeah, I, I don't that understand. Has no authority right now whatsoever. It's all on the ZBA. The ZBA can instruct the building commissioner what to do or not to. Your questions can't be answered by staff. That's so what I was telling you when it was. So I'm, I'm, so I'm asking have, you. No, I'm, I'm gonna, you I'm know, gonna pause I, this for just yeah. a moment. Um, why don't we table this mm -hmm. um, and we can bring this up at the end of the agenda? Okay. There was an email that came through um, just today about this, um, and so we can put that under the under 48 hours. Um, yeah. Item on the agenda, but let's let's move it along. But I, I have sure. questions as well, yeah. so let's, let's okay. just table those. Thanks. Now. Thank you. Um, all right, so we'll open it up to public comment. Um, please raise your hand, provide your name and address. Uh, please keep topics to the no fighting, uh, under please. the purview of the board, uh, and please no derogatory or campaign-related comments. Ms. Brown. Uh, at your first town meeting this year, you mentioned something about adequate to the instructional motions when people uh, want something done, they could make an instructional motion. A year and a half ago, I made an instructional motion to report to town meeting the use of Memorial Park. That has not been done. Um, and I think it should be uh, for several reasons. Number one, I think people have the right to know exactly what can and cannot be done with that thing. And as I keep saying, you're putting the burden on the uh, administrator and not on your board. The thing was given very strict rules. Uh, I've talked to her several times. She said, well, I understand it's not organized sports. That's not what Pete says. I'm going to suggest very strongly that you talk to the Attorney General's office and let's get a straight out once and for all because you know I would write a letter to them. I want to resolve the issue one way or another. Uh, on a nicer note, the plaque is on the flagpole and I want to thank Bob and uh, our veterans agent for the help that they've given. And he sorted it out because it didn't come in until Thursday and the day before. The day before. Thank you, Bob. Uh, also, and going back to the older crowd, uh, I'm old enough to remember the coconut rope fight, and I don't want to see that happen around. Right. Thank you. Carl? Uh, Carl McGann, very good to see you. Camille Anthony's son in law. I just, from, on behalf of the family, I just want to say thank you to Jane and, and Brian, because when the project was first there, I mean, they're tremendous. I, I can be a little pushy. Shall we say at times getting ready to get it done, but with Bob and like that. I mean they were phenomenal. It was amazing where last week I think when Jane said, um, it's supposed to be scheduled for when I'm like like three days from now to take to get done and, and they moved, they moved mountains and they dug up the road and it was it was amazing and um, I just want to thank everyone publicly for all their hard work and their tremendous job. And another thing in reference with RMLD, they paid for the consultant, right? To get the report. I would imagine so. I, I, I don't know the answer. Okay. <laughs> Any other public comment? Yes. Larry Hurley, 274 Ash Street. The Vice President of the Reading Softball Little League. Uh, we were at the recommended meeting, as you stated. We were there for two reasons. One was the opening of Sunday mornings at First Meadow. I mean, also, what we really were asking for was the opening for four Sundays at First Meadow in the spring. The reason being, our season is seven weeks long. Three of those Sundays are Mother's Day, Memorial Day, and the graduation, which we are not allowed at all that day. Um, we can't use more than four. We are in limited time. Uh, the weather has become, we've been, this is going to be our fourth season. The weather has been bad every season. Last season, we had to cancel over, postpone over 70 games. We had 60% of our season had to be rescheduled. Thankfully, we did have Killam, which was a lifesaver. As much as it is in the great field, it, was playable at times. We still had to play double headers a lot towards the end. We have already cut games before last season. 
we're not here because we want to be here. We're here because there is a need. You know, the weather, that's what spring is in New England now, unfortunately. That's not going to change. <coughs> um, the late starts at the high school now for during the week when we have games. The varsity and JV games are going to start later, which means it's going to get into our time. We have to be off the fields by a certain time on the lighted field for another organization. And because of darkness, the other two fields become unplayable. Um, we're looking for, the rec committee was generous enough to give us the one Sunday they were allowed to give us. They gave us May 31st. We are asking for 426, 53, and 517, which would be the other three, which was one under the select board's purview. We're hoping, you know, that we can get on the agenda to discuss this further. Also, you know, the biggest issue that our families have all had with this is the high school fields, the turfs, are under a separate jurisdiction. And there are some organizations that get to use the field before 12 on Sunday on those. And, you know, the girls in this town deserve deserve some fight for them, and I'm here to do that. You know, what we're looking for is consistency all around. Uh, Jenna had contacted peer communities a couple years ago. 29, I believe, out of 30 were Sunday morning use. We're not looking to turn the whole town upside down. We were looking for Birch Meadow softball fields only. We're not looking to go to Sturgis or any of the other fields. You know, we'd like that to be considered. And the rec mission statement, you know, it does say to adapt in there, adapt to the community's needs, and we'd like to see that done. The rec committee does not have the authority to do just that. That's on you, and I respectfully ask the put us on the agenda for further thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Yes. I'm Bob Hayes, 739 Pearl Street, President of the Reading Softball. In addition to Larry's comments, I'd just like to add a few things for either clarity or expansion. Um, part of the problem with waiting, as it's been suggested, until a point of need shows up, is just simply the bureaucratic process of getting through the rec committee's meeting schedule and then your agenda. When we know it's going to rain, we don't have time. So last year, or not last year, the year before, we started this, I believe, in like February or March. We got the approval from the board for just that year only. We had to kill them last year, we thought would be okay. We still had to cancel or reschedule 65% of our games. Now the problem is this is an all Reading girls league. It's an instructional league and it's, it's exactly what we want to be. When we first decided this league, was four years ago the league had 140 players. The first year we took it over, it had 250. Second year it had 296. Last year we had 315 girls. Our early bird sign-up and our, and our registration right now is almost at 300. And this isn't just a matter of need because we want to expand the league and grow crazy. That's not what we're trying to do, but we need to accommodate the girls that we have playing for us. And when we think of the fact that the boys' baseball league in town had grown to over 600 players in one year, it's, it's kind of frustrating when you hear people in my comments, like, you got to you know, downsize, you want to you know, limit the amount of people who can play. I think some of the things like these early starts on Sundays help us tremendously if we don't get a lot of rain, which has never been the case in New England. I've lived here my whole life. In the spring, we wouldn't have to deal with this issue as often as we do. And the other thing, a little kind of pat on our back here, we as an organization, I think we've proven ourselves as a civically minded organization. We have done community food drives at our championship days. We've donated new uniforms to the girls softball team. And as many people know, we run a lot of clinics that break even or less for girls, whether they're fielding, pitching, hitting, and whatnot. And anybody here, and I hope you've seen it, has looked at the $50,000 investment we just made in redoing Sturgis. This is not to suggest in any way that we as a league need special treatment. That's not what we're looking for. But we're very proud of the product that we put here. This is a great community-based program. We're trying to keep it as rock solid as possible. We want to make sure the girls have a great experience. And so far, I think we've done a pretty good job. So these early Sunday morning stats are really very important to the league. And there is no waiting until the time we need them because then it's just impossible. This is an ongoing issue. It's been happening way too long. It's just, it's crazy. It's, a, it's an antiquated law about early stats. And I really like to get on the agenda to see if we can get this, this, this fixed, at least for these three Sundays. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? All right. 
Uh, so, Bob, are you moving on to the hearing? Sure. Do we have a hearing notice? Yes, I have it. Wait one second. The shift. Sorry, one second. To figure out where I put it. It doesn't want to make itself available. I got it. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. To the inhabitants of the town of Reading, please take notice that the select board of the town of Reading will hold a public hearing on December 3rd, 2019 at 7.20 p.m. in the select board's meeting room, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Massachusetts, to amend the FY20 classification plan. A copy of the proposed document regarding this topic is available in the town manager's office, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Mass., Monday, Wednesday, Thursday from 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., Tuesday from 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m., and will be in the select board meeting packet posted at www.reddingma.gov on Wednesday, November 27, 2019. All interested parties are invited to attend the hearing or may submit their comments in writing or by email prior to 4 p.m. on December 3rd, 2019 to townmanager at ci.reading.ma.us by order of Robert W. Lalasher, town manager. Great. Bob? Thank you. I think this request is quite simple. Um, the Arcasa Board has been meeting since the end of the federal grant, which was October 1st, to map out a plan to go ahead. Um, they expect to perhaps make a final vote later this month uh, on what that path will be. And when they do that, I'll certainly report that to the board. Uh, John Halsey, as your liaison, has been attending. Um, for now, the only vote that the um, group has made is to change the name from Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse known as ARCASA, uh, to instead be Reading Coalition for Prevention and Support. And they've also discussed just calling it Reading Coalition for short. Um, I'll just quickly summarize that instead of being against something, being for something was highly on everyone's mind that they wanted to be for something. And um, support is more than just substance abuse support. It's a, it's a mental health, it's a broadening of the mission, if you will. So the request in front of you is simply to remove the word ARCASA from three job descriptions, two of which are filled, one of which is vacant and not funded, um, to instead use the word coalition. That's all. Great, thank you. Uh, any questions from the board before we move to, to public comment? Any public comment on the hearing? Hearing none. Uh, why don't we close the hearing? Do a motion? Move that the select board close the hearing on the FY20 classification plan. Is there a second? Yes, second. All those in favor? Great. Uh, so, assuming there's no discussion, can you make, make your motion, Mark, to approve? Move that the select board approve the FY20 <coughs> classification plan as presented. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Great. Motion carries. Um, next up. Okay, so the 7.30 agenda item is not necessary. Mm -hmm. So Me, meaning you're ahead of schedule. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, Find how that works. Yeah. Move right into licenses again. Um, we had no problems with any of the licenses um, in terms of a further discussion. Um, from past discussions, these are motions that do need to be fully read. Sorry, Mark. Uh, they're pretty extensive. <laughs> the dispenser. Oh, two side. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, is there a, 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 a question? So, Bob, you said earlier on that um, in the discussion about the occupancy issues, mm -hmm. that does not relate to the licenses. Is that correct? correct? It would not be a condition that would violate an alcohol license per se. Got it. Can, can I ask two questions? One is. Um, I think we should put this on a future agenda. That's probably the more important one. But the other is, in a circumstance like that, does uh, the fire chief or the police chief have the authority to close down an establishment for that? The fire chief does. Yes, yes. We can bring the occupancy down to what the license by the building inspector to have. And the, the occupancy numbers are set by, by, the, uh, by the architect for the, when they design the occupancy based upon the use, and then the building inspector accepts, accepts it or not, and it's posted, we require it to be posted. We can buy chapter 148 bring it down to what the uh, occupancy might be done. Okay. I'm going to suggest that we have a discussion about this on a, at a future agenda. I just want to also note the deputy chief was, uh, is that an emergency? He will be here, otherwise he may or may not be able to join us. 
Yes. Bob, can I ask you to make a note to include yeah. this as a potential future agenda item? No. Thank you. If, unless there's any further discussion, if you want to start. Well, oh, wait. Uh, yes. <laughs> Earlier this year, there was some question about um, the ABCC coming in to look at uh, possible violations of their, you know, not under not a town a town inspection, but an ABCC mm -hmm. uh, inspection. Is that not relevant to what um, the board doing? is allowed to consider that? Mm -hmm. um, but the penalties they impose were just written warnings, so okay. that's not really much teeth for you to right. consider. Okay. From what I understand. Okay. Right, can I ask another question? Right. Um, so we've approved new or new changes that are effective Gen One. Correct. Is that right? Um, how and when do those get published? Do we publish in advance of that date, or I'm just wondering what's the um, mechanism? We just got the final draft, I think, this week. Yeah. From Ibria. Um, they don't need to be published per se, but they will certainly be circulated to all the license holders, just to be safe. I could send and, them out in our renewals. Yeah, and they'll be on the website. I think that's a great idea to send them out. Yes, please. Yeah. We also perhaps include a note, even if it's brief, that says no changes to sections X, Y, and Z. Okay. Yeah. To just draw their attention to it. Yeah. Andy? Um, so we're about to renew uh, a bunch of licenses for establishments, one of which. Uh, there was a fight of a uh, number of 22-year-olds which may or may not have been influenced by alcohol for a license that we're about to um, renew. Is it, is it possible to, for the board to hold off on um, that particular license um, and, and have a conversation with the owner about the importance of, uh, you know, if they want to keep the license, and I'm, it, Bob, let me know if I'm uh, off base here, um, but that they stick to the stick to the occupancy requirements. I don't know if we can make the connection or not. Yes. Well, yeah, um, I'm not a lawyer, but the only way I can imagine that even happening would be for you to do whatever business you can complete tonight, but continue the hearing to a date certain this month. Mm -hmm. That's one of your three budget meetings. And then maybe we, and not tomorrow night, <coughs> then maybe uh, one of the days next week we can have town council and the owner here. I, I don't know beyond that if there's real teeth there. Yeah. Uh, to clarify, is this, was the occupancy evaluation, uh, is that a frequent occurrence at that establishment? Have you heard? I haven't heard that. I wouldn't know, but I've heard of it for Wednesday night, absolutely, before Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. um, we put it on our radar. We received a phone call from Kevin um, from the Kennedy Police Department concerned that there were some establishments in town that um, have, have um, overcrowding issues or, or had had overcrowding issues. So um, based upon that, because it was late in the day, later in the day, um, we called all of those establishments, told them that we may be coming out to do a compliance check, and told them that they're, they have specific occupancy numbers that are supposed to be posted, and that they're not to receive them. And also informed them of the um, Mass General Law, Chapter 148, I believe it's 34A, that uh, has specific fines. The fine in there is up to five thousand dollars for the first offense. Um, so the assistant chief called each one of them and uh, asked to speak to the manager and gave them that information and had, and had a conversation with them. Um, one of them called back and I ended up talking to them and, and also um, told them of our concerns and then we gave me out to the compliance check. We didn't want to surprise them. We wanted to give them notice. We wanted them to be proactive and stop a problem before it occurred. So that was that was the reason why we uh, took, took those steps. And and one of those establishments you ended up going out to, and in spite of your uh, sort of reminder that of the occupancy limits, they were quite a bit over. Is that right? Responded from medically, treated the medic, treated the um, person, and transported somebody. Um, 
they cleared the scene and the police when they were doing their investigation they wanted to go inside the establishment to talk to maybe some witnesses mm -hmm. and that's when uh, just right at the front door they encountered overcrowding and it made it difficult for them to get inside yeah so then they took steps to um, bring the occupancy down to a more uh, safe place so my only concern is that that um, is to is would be to vote to approve a license for um, this establishment. Council Board. Question first, if I could, is it only one establishment we're talking about? I've, I've heard two fights tonight. I don't know about the second one. So I can't say okay, before. so that that tells uh, me the second location. The okay. board. And again, I, I don't I don't believe parts, but this establishment has not been publicly named. There is an active investigation. I don't know what you do. Um, once we issue the license, if there is a violation, the future actions uh, that can be taken are fines. Correct. Yeah, the, the board issuing a license has no bearing whatsoever on measures the board may wish to take against that establishment and is completely unrelated to what the fire chief may, may do. I'd be inclined to move forward with approving the license renewal and then if the board uh, either feels the need or if there is some, there is a need or a recommendation from buyer because they're not following it, um, I don't want to overly penalize a business um, that hasn't been identified publicly over what is still an investigation in progress. I'm sort of yeah. I'm on the fence here, but yeah. that's that's direction I'm leaning. And the I, new license is effective. Is the, the new license effective immediately or January, January. one? January. Okay. Yeah, I think I'd be inclined to approve it also, but I think that there needs to be a way to to address the issue, and if the ongoing investigation restricts information. Um, that could really delay that discussion. Um, and I, I think putting it off to a not date certain is probably not a good idea. Um, certainly to the extent it's a future agenda item, when things are, are a little clearer, uh, you can invite anyone you want into that discussion in terms of the license holder. Yeah, I'm inclined to move forward as is and then um, see what results from the investigation. Do we have a sense of when the investigation might conclude or um, when we might have more information that would be publicly available? I, I just heard about it for the first time today, so I'd have to say, I don't know, at least a week uh, in terms of getting feedback from the APCC and the council and having a full discussion. That seemed right. Yeah, yes, I, I, I don't want to speak for the police right. because I, you know, I, don't, I don't know, mm -hmm. they're, they're more in terms of the agency than I am. Yeah. I, don't, I don't have any dealings with them um, on, on how um, the Mass Terminal Chapter 148 Section 34 is, um, uh, what, what the rights to find under that are, I want to get a clarification from the uh, town council. Well, we would expect to have some more information before these licenses take effect January 1. The tricky part is that your last meeting this year is a week from tomorrow night. Right. So it has to be then or else you can always call and get me. Right. Right. I just, I can't answer this timing question. Well, this may be a question for legal counsel, so maybe we can add this to the list. But once a license is issued, do we have the authority to revoke the license mid-year? Certainly, but there's, you know, there's I'm, hurdles I'm for that. I'm sure there are hurdles, but yes. assuming um, on sort of repeated violations for the occupancy, what I want to make sure is that if, if we choose to approve it today, mm -hmm. that we have recourse next year, should there be ongoing problems, or if there's recommendation from the staff according. You do, but <clears throat> this violation is really not a liquor violation proper. Mm -hmm. It's, right. a different, right, right. it's a different section. So that's right. why I can't answer some of your questions tonight. I, I have a, a, just a question about the anonymity of, of the establishment. Um, it, 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 Chief Burns, is it when you respond uh, to provide medical assistance at an establishment, um, is that 
Is that public record, public knowledge? Yes, there is a public log that shows where we go. Yeah. So, so technically, you know, the police investigation aside, in which I respect, um, it, 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 it should be public knowledge uh, which institution this was. Um, again, I, I don't want to double penalize them, uh, Vanessa. It, it just gives, uh, it gives me pause to vote for an establishment that just ignored the call from the police had an overcrowding issue and a fight break out. Um, and so uh, um, I don't understand why why that information can't be made public. Yeah, and 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 how, why that can't help influence what we do tonight. Bob, um, just to be clear, I, at no time did I say it could not be made public. I mm -hmm. just said it hadn't been made public. You want to say the name of your board of I don't know the name. I mean, I knew the name, but... I have a proposed suggestion. Yes. So, these licenses are broken down into categories. We have package stores, clubs, the veterans clubs, and then all alcohol restaurants and beer and water licenses. What we could do is split these so that we could vote to approve package clubs, veterans, and we could delay the all alcohol restaurants, beer and wine restaurant licenses until next Wednesday to see if there is additional information, which at, at that point we could, if there is nothing noteworthy, we could approve en masse. If there is something noteworthy that results from the investigation, we could take that one up individually. Does that work? I'd be fine with that. Yeah. And it would save you the reading of all of this list today. <laughs> Just putting it off for another day. All right. Uh, are we comfortable? Bob, does that work for you? Again, I can't give you a legal, legal advice. I have no idea. Mechanically, we can make that happen if you continue the hearing to a time certain. Uh, I mean, the, the stipulation here is that there may be a situation where we continue the hearing and at our next meeting next Wednesday, we still don't have any additional information. And in that situation, we need to decide if we are going to vote to approve or if we are going to continue it to a meeting that we don't have on the calendar right now, to, which is the week before Christmas. And I can get some legal advice prepared for you for Wednesday okay. as to whether this should or shouldn't proceed in a certain way. Okay. Let's um, do that. that would be helpful. All right. Fair. Great. So, Mark, if you can start us off with the first motion for package stores. Move that the select board approve the all alcoholic package store liquor licenses for HT Reading Liquors LLC, DBA Bay State Liquors, 345 Main Street, Raksha Inc., DBA Square Liquors, 13 High Street, Jay and Ricky Inc., DBA Ricky's Liquors, 214 Main Street, and Stasi Brookline Inc., DBA Reading Fine Wine and Spirits, 25 Walkers Brook Drive, uh, Kajal and Kevin LLC, DBA The Liquor Junction, One General Way, and Pomplamoose Inc., DBA Pomplamoose, 26 Haven Street. For a term expiring December 31, 2020, subject to the following conditions. All bylaws, rules, and regulations of the Town of Reading and of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts shall be followed and subject to a satisfactory inspection of the establishment by the town manager or his designee. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Clubs? Move that the select board approve the all alcoholic club liquor licenses for Meadowbrook Golf Corp of Reading, Mass, DBA Meadowbrook Golf Club, 292 Grove Street, Home Building Corp, DBA Knights of Columbus, 11 Sanborn Street, for a term expiring December 31st, 2020, subject to the following conditions All bylaws, rules, and regulations of the Town of Reading and of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts shall be followed and subject to a satisfactory inspection of the establishment by the town manager or his designee. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Veteran clubs? Move that the select board approve the All Alcoholic Veteran Club Liquor Licenses for Reading Veterans Association, Inc., DBA, American Legion, Post 62, 37 Ash Street. For a term expiring December 31, 2020, subject to the following conditions. All bylaws, rules, and regulations of the Town of Reading and of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts shall be followed and subject to a satisfactory inspection of the establishment by the town manager or his designee. Is there a second? Second. second. Oh. All those in favor? Okay, uh, and so we will continue the hearing to 
Uh, yes, Bob. That's why I just wanted to ask you a question. Sure. Um, I remember running into a problem when we continued to hear into a different building, which this would be. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll have to get a legal opinion on that. So the board could continue uh, to Wednesday, December 11th at 7 a.m. at the Pleasant Street Center, which is where you're going to be posted to meet. Um, I think that'll work. One thing you could do, which is going to sound weird, is continue it to tomorrow night when I can have an answer for where you need to meet for the continuation. You can continue it to Pleasant Street Center tomorrow night, but it's going to get way too complicated. So I just don't know if legally you can continue a meeting to a different building. I think we've run into an issue with that before. I'm going to need town council's advice. Uh, okay. So, so I, will, I will suggest 7 o'clock, right, right at the start of the meeting, let's go with Pleasant Street Center and look for the best. And 7 p.m. So, yeah, yeah, right. Um, so, hey, give me a little bit of uh, <laughs> in, hard competition. That we are, we cannot legally continue it at a different building. I, I think you can change that tomorrow night. We can change that and say, for example, 6 30 here. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Uh, great. So, let's continue the hearing to. December. Wednesday, December 11th yeah. at 7 p.m. at the Pleasant Street Senior Center. Right. So, now the, the licenses, the liquor licenses. We have, of we have the Pledge of Clare for the Liquor Junction. Any background information here for us, Bob? No, it's not something we see a lot, but it was routine. The police did a background check, it's fine. Uh, any questions from the board? We have a motion. Move that the select board approve the pledge of collateral application for Liquor Junction. Am I reading the right one? Okay. Yes. One general way, Reading, Massachusetts. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Great. Sure. All right. So next up, oh, Bob. I ask that you swap the next two ones around. Um, have the uh, HR one first. Okay. Uh, so next up, we will have Judy Perkins from HR uh, talking to us about employee attraction, um, retention, and training opportunities. Well, thank you very Welcome. much. I have had the pleasure of meeting you. Hi. 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 Um, or we can open a window as a plan B, but I save that comment for the director next. <laughs> yeah. Layers. Layers. Yeah. It's totally. it's one day of my really heavy sweater. I can crack the door if I really need it. Uh, is, is that off now? Everything is off. Okay, great. Whew. All right, Judy, all yours. Great. Um, I'm good. Condense HR into about 15 minutes for you folks. How's that? I'm going to do the best that I can to show you what it is that we're trying to do with regards to leadership, um, retention of employees, and what our basic philosophies are. I'm going to hand it out to um, some of the department heads in here because this is some of the training that we're putting into place for that because everything starts from leadership down. So I'm going to try and entertain you for a few minutes and let these first videos speak for themselves. They're only a few minutes long, so if you can't hear them, please let me know. Set. 
and we lead by example one way or the other. Model what it is you want to see, connect and involve. Give people the time you'd like to be given. Let them know you've got their back and appreciate them. Talk, listen, show, share. Connecting is how you'll hear things sooner rather than later. Connecting is how you'll learn more, inspire more, and how you'll encourage people to make better things happen. Have more frequent and meaningful conversations about what it is you and your team do and the value you bring to the world. Show people the big picture more often and help them connect to it personally. Invite people to see things from your view, your vantage point, so they're more informed and get better at solving problems with you and without you. You want stronger people? Future leaders? You've got to involve them more now in solving the challenges you face. Wherever you can, let somebody else lead the effort to make something good happen. Think about it. When we're more involved in something, we're more responsible to it, and we care more, right? Remember, each of us every day has these one-second opportunities. One-second opportunities where we can change everything with a little more patience, a little more encouragement, a little more connection, a little more involvement. Leadership, it's really not complex. It's simply caring about the people we work with, involving them the way we'd like to be involved, treating them the way we'd like to be treated. Not rocket science, just the goal. Model the behavior you want to see. Connect with the people you lead. Involve them wherever you can. Is it a time to make more good things happen for everyone? So that's just a brief training video for our leaders. And obviously we know that if we can't lead by example, we can have some issues with retention. Um, so bringing folks on, especially into the public arena, can be a little bit of a challenge. We don't have quite as many people wanting to enter public service as we used to, you know, two decades ago and, and beyond. Um, so when we're bringing new people in, this is part of our new onboarding process. It's called um, Smile and Move. <laughs>
brief affirmation of, of what we'd like to see more from our employees, and I think we have a, a pretty good group of folks here that, that do that. Um, but in order to get a little bit more into um, what it is that HR does here, because we do have our hands in a lot of things, um, I'm going to just play a, a brief eight minute video for you that kind of gives you eight minutes worth of HR jam packed. How's that? <laughs> just narrate a couple of things for you. Just meeting a few of our employees.
do have to talk about that as well. And Fred Fryer is another um, training organization that we use mostly for professional development. They have thousands of um, programs that are available both on your desktop and on site. These are just a sample. Maya-based trainings, we start with some wellness. And these are classes that we've had in this past year that our employees have been involved in. Tuesday trail walks, the town manager has actually joined us. Like presentation. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. I know there's a lot inside of eight minutes, but I wanted to keep it brief. Uh, thank you for that, Judy. Uh, any questions? Well, actually, I had a question, and then I'll, I'll sure. hand it over. Um, you mentioned right at the end there um, reviewing of medical records. Yeah. Um, so can you clarify what that means in terms of what you have access to as far as uh, employees' medical records? When it comes to public safety, I'm actually the, the adjuster for the insurance company because technically my office is an insurance agency at that point. Um, and I do review medical records. I do look at them and see if the uh, treatment is appropriate for what the injury is. And when I have a question, I send it off to our town physician um, so they can look at it and see if there is need to send anybody down there for an evaluation or if it's reasonable and customary treatment. And if so, then we move forward. Otherwise, we ask questions and put it off to the, um, the professionals. And they let us know whether it's reasonable and customary. And you never know. Sometimes somebody might be treating for a left knee injury and they're getting prescribed something for a right wrist. 
You don't know. So you've got to really look at those. Is it for workers' compensation or all health records? It's public safety, injury, in the line of duty. Not their, not their personal health records. Just injured in the line of duty, which technically um, can be considered to a certain extent um, public record, but it's only the injury itself that's public, none of the records, none of the personal records that, you know, that I'm HIPAA uh, certified for that. Thank you. Bob? And um, Judy has asked for a year or so whether this is a good idea for an HR person to be doing, and it doesn't really sound like it at first. It's kind of historic, and a lot of towns do it this way, but as part of the budget process this winter, um, I am looking at proposals to outsource this part. Um, Judy's very good at it and has a lot of experience at it, but <clears throat> it seems like perhaps a medical professional could get involved right away instead of when she needs them, <clears throat> and she could be more neutral in the process. So just to it, it finish odd, that off. That difficult. is different. Yeah. Yep. It, is, it can be difficult because uh, there's things in there that I don't want to know. Um, and I don't like being the bad guy when it comes to having to say, well, I found out that this really isn't work-related, is it, it doesn't have a causal relation to the work that you do. Um, and I'm usually the one that has to deliver that message. I'm not the one that's making that decision. I'm taking the advice of, of the professionals, the doctors and, and case managers. But usually it's me that has to deliver that message. It doesn't go over well, so I prefer not to be in that spot. <coughs> A uh, couple of questions. Sure. Thanks. Um, I love that there's a lot of customer service training that mm -hmm. goes on. I'm wondering, how do we do benchmarking uh, toward that? In other words, how we're, we're doing. And then, separate but very related, is do we do regular anonymous surveys asking people to talk to us about how we're doing? I know that we do, um, I'll call it named surveys, where after a service is completed, there's a form that says, how did we do? Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we do anonymous ones as well. Ooh, and I want to tack on to that um, 360 reviews as well for employees. Okay. And, um, and management. Sorry. Okay, sure. Um, I have not done any benchmarking. Um, I really started um, this past year focusing on making sure that everybody got that customer service training. I knew it was a goal of, of the board to make sure that everybody had that delivered to them. So. Um, this past year, we've really focused on finding the right type of training. The Kennedy micro trainings are great because you can go in, you can do a five minute training, and then the next day you can do the next five minute training. And they come in those um, different little modules. So you could get a plethora of, of training within you know, a matter of, say, five or six weeks that really covers everything from phone skills to um, reception and, and, and what have you. Um, with regard to the um, the benchmarking, I really don't have that um, down pat. This, unless somebody were to tell me that there was something wrong or that some, someone wasn't performing right, or if it, if it came through as a bad performance review, um, because there were a lot of complaints. Um, certainly, if people are complaining, they're complaining to the town manager's office. A lot of times, um, I don't hear that, but occasionally I do. And you know, we'll have a discussion. But there's been really nothing that has made it to my desk as far as you know bad customer service here at town hall i'll be honest with you yeah. i'm wondering if there are um there certainly are benchmarks available in the non-governmental side of things right but i would imagine there are in governmental also i just wonder what's what's Probably there yeah with bigger staffs i would imagine i mean there's um well, i think all sizes is yeah, my guess there's one and a half of me yeah no <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering if this if mma might be a resource here um I, I could certainly field the question, but I'm not. I'm not sure. Yeah, we, we can. Maybe we'll reach out to some folks we know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then the other one's on anonymous surveys. Is that something that's that's being contemplated or, or could be contemplated? I haven't done any surveys. I'm assuming if I get up to full staffing, that's a possibility that at some point we could um, we could get that done. Uh, but that's something that would be done in partnership with the town manager's office. Is that also true for the 360 reviews and peer reviews? So it's, it's in my experience, it's pretty standard that you both evaluate your manager and your peers evaluate you. Uh, we we haven't done that here in the past. Um, uh, I, from other communities that I've worked in or worked with, I don't know of anybody that does that except for top management. Okay. Well. And just uh, so you're aware, the um, review process is um, integrated into collective bargaining 
So mm -hmm. does the unions need to approve any changes? Um, <laughs> we all use the same evaluation form, except me now. Mm -hmm. But you've seen what the form is, because we used it on me once or twice. So all but uh, one of the unions uses that form, and one union doesn't get evaluated. But it is a collective bargaining process that we'd have to go through to make changes, not that I'm opposed to them, just so you know. And we are in the process of building the um, HR module within Munis, um, and we've had to be very careful to stay very specific to that um, performance review form because of the collective bargaining. I mean, there's nothing on there that isn't on the actual form itself because we just have to be very careful. So one quick question. Did you say that you, the, all the work you do is for town schools and RMLD? Yes. As far as benefits go. Oh, benefits. Benefits, okay. yes. Benefits, okay. Um, we handle benefits for the town, the school, RMLD, and all of our retirees, and that includes retired teachers. Thank you. Well, and, and that therefore overlaps into the whole payroll function, if you will, of the finance department benefits or a portion of the payroll, which okay. is done for all of those uh, employees. Yeah. Thank you. I know that, um, that you mentioned that there's been training uh, for all staff on issues related to harassment, and you've done training um, through the Mass Commission Against Discrimination. And I was wondering, and I think this would be a, a very challenging undertaking, um, but if you have taken or if there are steps that can be taken to kind of encourage a culture where people feel safe coming forward to HR if they are having an issue, so that they, you know, I, I so that they feel like I can do this without fear of retaliation. I mean, I think training and letting people know what their rights are certainly is um, is one of those things. But is there is there anything that you've seen in the course of your work that can help encourage people to feel like this is an avenue that they can feel comfortable taking? Sure, thank you. Um, we've actually had um, a few people that have come forward for different reasons, um, and it was not long after the training. We did mm, an a, a, across yeah. the um, town um, training, so everybody got the sexual harassment training. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just about sexual harassment, it was mm -hmm. about workplace bullying yeah. uh, and, yeah. and other things that tend to really kind of, you know, um, drive the culture, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so we've really worked on changing the attitudes of people and the culture and, you know, what used to be okay is not okay any longer. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really kind of um, worked its way out where a lot of those folks that were more of the issue have now moved on. They've either retired or they've gone to other communities because they're no longer comfortable here because eyes are watching them. And they know that they're going to come to me and, you know, I've sat down and done 32-page investigatory reports mm -hmm. on, you know, bad behavior. Mm -hmm. um, you know, once you stop peeling that onion, you know, you keep getting into things more and more. And um, I'm of the mindset that I like to get to the rub. And um, I'm usually not satisfied until I get there. And then I turn everything over to the town manager and we have a nice long discussion and mm -hmm. he gets to decide what he wants to do. <laughs> uh, if, um, so two questions. Uh, are the customer service and other trainings required? Is there any number that employees are required to do annually? Yes. Um, well, not necessarily annually. It depends. Um, sexual harassment training, um, everybody is required to do that. Mm -hmm. um, with regards to customer service, everybody, as they come on, they get that customer service training. Then periodically, I'll send them assignments because I have the, on my dashboard, I can send them assignments. So if their manager were to call me and say, so-and-so is having difficulty with you know, X, Y, Z. I'll look for the training and I will send it either through local GovU or Kennedy directly to that individual's desktop and I can get a report back to see that they've completed that training. So it's on an as-needed basis? In some circumstances, yes, but I mean, we do do periodic trainings requiring everyone to participate. The standard compliance, ones, yes. And uh, as you can imagine, you think the widespread diversity of the tasks the organization does um, that decision is really up to the department head, but even within departments, there's several you know, groups that are very different from each other. Um, I could step in unilaterally and do things, but that tends not to work in such a diverse organization, if you will. Right. Um, if there were themes of problems or issues, then that would be appropriate, certainly. And maybe more feedback in some way might help uncover some of that if it's out there. 
And we have had training specifically for um, a focused group, um, uh, things such as drug and alcohol awareness. Um, one thing that had not been um, done previously was um, the DOT training so that everyone, not just the managers, but the, um, the peers within um, the DBW that all have um, CDL licenses, they need to have that training. So if they see something wrong, they're going to be able to legally report it and we'll be able to get past all of, um, all of that minutia. I just realized some of the board members may not have seen this. There used to be green cards and it used to be available through the website. Feedback, exactly as you're imagining. Um, we did that for several years. There were five ratings, one, two, three, five, five being the best, one being the worst. Um, after several years of getting 96% at four and five, we stopped because we're thinking, okay, you know, there's a few issues every year that come up. We address them, but this isn't really capturing any problems. We need to rethink this or come up with a different way. So we, that effort has happened in the past extensively, but not for a few years now. Um, it, has there been additional discussions to further that feedback concept to identify either areas for improvement or problem areas? Um, we've done it more targeted. So for instance, certain uh, conservation was one area that was done a few years ago where there was a target. Um, Jean and I discussed doing another area of her department. Uh, I think we discussed it last spring and never proceeded um, in terms of targeting people who pulled certain permits and then asking for their feedback. Um, again, you know, what's the what's the objective? I guess was always the first question. What are we looking to find? And if if for instance we pulled building permits and asked people to return a survey. Um, do you want it anonymously or not is one question. I don't know the answer. In a regulatory role, are we getting honesty from people who need to come back and see the town again and again? That's another important thing for us to think about. Um, you know, if there's a problem, is this a way to uncover it? So those are the kinds of things we've discussed. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, th this was on employee retraction and retention. Mm -hmm. And I think you you covered the uh, attraction pretty well in the, both the videos and in this um, this pa page uh, 61 of our packet where um, you've done a, you say you've done 135 new hires promotions uh, and reactivations. Um, there were 63 job postings and you've had over a thousand applicants for those 63 so uh, it seems like the the attracting part is going well what what I've um, asked for in the past and um, in, in looking for is is data on uh, the retention part uh, because we hear anecdotes people leave after 30 days or whatever we, we've heard that in this room um, but it's really hard to get a grip on if that's a problem or not without without seeing um, some numbers about retention going back a couple of years. Well, I can tell you in the five and a half years that I've been here, mm -hmm. um, I do not believe we have had a problem with retention. Um, we've had probably one person that I can recall that came here um, for three months and decided that they liked what they were doing previously and went back to their previous job. We have had folks that have left here and asked if they could take a leave of absence in case they don't like their other job, they want to come back. We've had folks that have actually gone, thought they were going to be done, and then have come back. You know, we've, we've gladly taken them back because Absolutely. you've got that institutional knowledge that you, you're getting back when you bring them back. Um, the only thing that um, I would say with regards to retention goes that could be a problem for us is number one, we're, we're looking at a 3.6% unemployment rate and there's a lot of competition out there. Um, people who have that drive within them to do um, public service, they're here to stay for the most part. People who are looking for growth and opportunities, and that typically is you know younger folks, they stay for three to five years and they move on. And there's not much you can do to combat that because we're not offering the pay and benefits that the private sector is. And a lot of times we're losing people to that. I would say that out of all of my exit interviews that I've done 
if they weren't retiring to go on to you know a, a more calmer life um, they were moving on because of growth opportunities that just are not here for them and that's the nature of public service that said um, would, would the board be able to see actual data on retention over the past couple of years I've asked this before um, just to put numbers on it when you say retention what do you mean well um, you want to know how many people left and why they left no no uh, how many maybe just how many people left um, uh, and how long they had been in service that would you know give us a, a, a rough handle on you probably have all that data. yeah I could pull a report together through munis of the folks who have um, who have terminated um, for one reason or another. Um, uh, unfortunately, I'll have to scrub out a lot of the data because we've yeah. got folks that are, yeah. you know. Um, seasonal employees. Exactly, seasonal employees, workers. and they're not going to. Yeah. yeah. No. yeah. Um, and election workers and things of that nature. Um, but I, I could manage to scrub something together for you, yeah. um, if you if you don't mind waiting until next week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. I'm just looking for. Oh, people who were let go um, or who left and you know how long they they had been there you know I, I can tell obviously if they've honestly, left after 60 years well yeah, it's, it's a handful you know. it's not many it's a handful seriously yeah I mean I think I'd also be interested in any you know, what we have as far as vacancies and if we have any roles that have a high turnover rate if there are any right like are, do we have specific mm -hmm. roles that well, it's hard to keep people. Those are the seasonal jobs. Seasonal laborers are tough to get in here. And, you know, they tend to be a little bit more difficult. You know, you want to really be able to identify those good employees and then hopefully move them into a more permanent position. Um, but those are the tougher positions, honestly. It's the seasonal positions that are tough to fill because people are looking for permanent employment. I think seasonal is probably not what we're most interested in. I, I don't want to speak for others, but um, because by the very nature of it, mm -hmm. it's seasonal. You're, you're going to have more turnover on those particular roles mm -hmm. because you're right, people want full time jobs. Right. Um, so I think I'd be more interested in full or part time roles that are permanent as opposed to the seasonal. I, I think that actually the reason why they leave is an important part of it also. So it's mm -hmm. not just kind of here's what happened, here, here was the tenure. Right. But what, what was the, the reason at the mm -hmm. end? Just to see what's, what's happening. It may be clear. I do have clear. interviews that I've done. Um, I started doing that a couple of years ago. Um, not everybody wants to do an exit interview. Um, you know, we've had a couple of people that, you know, just were not a good fit, either for their own purpose or the purpose of the organization. Um, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good. Um, and sometimes it's better to part your ways, you know, and, and, you know, getting to the point where you understand that is the best thing. We've certainly had to do some separation agreements with folks, um, you know, that, that it wasn't a healthy relationship and, you know, we've need to, we've need to move on. Um, and then there's been some people that, you know, haven't been happy here for one reason or another and there's not much we can do about that. If you don't get along with people that you work with, if you don't, um, have respect for the organization, those things usually bubble to the top and they're going to be noticed and they're going to be brought to my attention and you know we, we're going to wind up having those conversations and I have a lot of conversations with department heads when those things happen. And I usually am, I try to be the voice of reasons. Anybody back there as a department head trying to speak up for me? <laughs> you know, they say, well wait a minute, if you're having a problem with somebody, you need to document it. You need to go through the process. You can't just say, okay, I've had it. I'm throwing my hands up in the air. This is the end of this. I'll say, well, wait a minute. I'm going to pull out the employee you know, file and say, there's nothing in here that says there's anything other than a stellar employee. You've got to go through the process. If there's a problem, then let's talk about a performance improvement plan. Let's talk about progressive discipline. Let's talk about taking the right road. Because we live in a very employee-friendly state, and we do not want to wind up down at the MCAD. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a No. No? OK. Do we have other questions from the board? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll Thanks for the information to Thank you. Next week. Thank you. All right. So, uh, Bob, you had asked us to move some things around so that facilities could wait. I, I see them outside yep. the door, but I don't know if they're quite ready. Oh, let me go out. I think so. Can we take okay. a quick break? And why don't we take a five-minute break? OK. Thanks.
All right, we're back in session, and next up we'll have uh, Joe Huggins telling us about past and future energy improvements. Thanks. I want to start by giving a little bit of an overview, and I'll turn it over to Joe. Um, Joe was hired by former school superintendent Pat Scatini a month before I began working for the town in 2005. So it's only through anecdotal stories I heard how he began to change a previous long-term approach and culture to facilities that was best described as one of total disarray. Um, one of Carol Roberts, the former HR administrator's hobbies was to count how many facilities directors there had been, and it was an average of about one a year for many, many years before Joe got here. <clears throat> uh, parents were especially uh, furious about the lack of maintenance and the condition, especially of schools. Within two years, Joe assembled a team of town and school staff to approach the issue of energy usage in a long-term and comprehensive way. We met for over 18 months to carefully design an RFQ for energy management services, which is legally defined under Mass General Law Chapter 25A and especially under Section 11L and it does not require that the town select the lowest bidder. And let me repeat that, it does not require the town select the lowest bidder, which is rare and, and really, really helpful. Um, we then received seven very detailed responses to the RFQ. I think they're about that thick, it was a box. Um, we met with them, interviewed the applicants over a period of a few months, and used the rigorous evaluation matrix, which was in that RFQ, and ended up selecting Noresco in 2008. My recollection is they were one of the middle priced vendors somewhere in the middle of the town. We then met with Noresco over a period of a couple of months to discuss exactly what energy improvements we should make. And after several of these meetings we agreed to a set of about five million dollars in changes with a break even of about 20 years. And by that I mean that energy savings annually would be paid to the vendor in the form of a lease payment requiring only school committee approval. Uh, after some internal staff discussion financially, we instead decided to take a different approach and approach town meeting to receive authorization to borrow the five million at a rate that was much cheaper than the lease payment terms. We ended up doing the exact same five million dollar of improvements and had debt service for 15 years instead of lease payments for 20 years. So that was an excellent result. This has now become a much more popular approach in the industry for communities that are willing to be that transparent. Uh, many of them still are not willing to go to town meeting and be transparent um, on things like that. Since then, Joe will discuss what other energy improvements were made by his department with additional annual funds, and he'll show you uh, measured energy savings over that period of time. Debt service for this first phase of energy improvements will end in FY25. So this summer, we met to start discussing planning for performance contracting phase two. Energy technology has changed significantly in some areas, such as LEDs, so items previously not cost-effective in 2008 are much more attractive now. There is also staff and community interest in alternative energy products that may not be the cheapest solution, quote-unquote, if measured only by short-term metrics. Since then, we have met with Noresco, as we are still working under that first performance contracting relationship. Uh, let me outline briefly a comprehensive five-step process that Noresco or someone else would go through. Number one is an investment grade audit. Joe will get into that in some more detail. Number two would be design engineering. Number three is construction. Number four is commissioning. And number five is ongoing measurement and services. So for our purposes and for the short run, only number one is important because the others are way down the road. Um, specifically, we envision working with interested community partners with a timeline that's now probably advanced from what we thought of last summer. And these are some of the milestones that we can imagine hitting. Uh, in March to develop, March 2020, develop a preliminary project scope. April, develop an energy savings plan. May to use some technology called in IntelliChoice. It's, it will technically spec the, the programs. And then if we're prepared after May, in June, we could develop final scope and pricing, and July, develop a final investment grade audit report, i.e., what are we measuring? So it's important to note that up until that point, even if we do all that, no decisions have been made on what to do, just what are we measuring? Um, in August, if Noresco uh, completes the IGA, the investment grade audit, this would complete the fact finding, quote unquote, and again, no decisions really have been made up till that point. Then the calendar becomes a little unclear. 
uh, we'd have to have town, school, community discussions on, quote, what to do, as well as, quote, how to pay for it. Um, the soonest I could imagine those discussions uh, being wrapped up, and if we proceed to town meeting, as I would expect to request that authorization, would be a year from this April, April 2021. I don't know if that's realistic, but I know that it can't really happen any faster. So I just wanted to give you some background before Joe then does his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So we just put together a, a quick agenda to outline what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, well, I'll give you the background and we're going to talk a little bit about the phase one, which was the ECM, the energy conservation measures, and there was 12 of them in the project from 2009. We'll talk about what those entail. Um, I'll also show you a slide on the verified savings after uh, year eight for the performance contract period. Um, the way performance contracting works is that you're, uh, there's a guaranteed savings associated with the project, and they do, um, we're in a 15 year agreement for measurement verification where they come out and make sure we're maintaining our equipment, that everything's running as should. We download them a bunch of our utility reports on consumption, and if we don't meet the mark as far as the guaranteed savings, um, and it's not anything that we're doing, the rest of the would write a check, and that's how performance contracting works. I'll show you how it has been working. Uh, we'll talk about energy management services as a whole. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, some ECMs that we've done since phase one, post phase one in the school and town buildings, just to kind of keep the ball rolling with things we've learned. And then we'll close it out with the proposed phase two project. So a big part of the project with, with performance contracting um, a lot of what carries a performance contracting initiative is lighting. Lighting has the fastest payback. Um, and we, at the time, uh, replaced a lot of the um, older fluorescent light fixtures with uh, high efficiency T8s and T5 systems throughout all of the, um, the buildings that are, that are under the agreement. So that's what carries the project and gives you the most savings over your, your payback. We also did lighting controls. As part of the investment grade audit, uh, Noresco came in and, and put um, lighting trackers in all areas to see what the usage was during the day and at night so we knew that where we could get the best savings. So there's motion sensors in a lot of the buildings that turn the lights off, occupancy sensors throughout all the facilities. We also did some domestic water conservation measures, uh, waterless urinals, um, some low flow toilets, um, aerators, um, on a lot of, there's a lot of sinks in a lot of the buildings as you can imagine. So we did that and that's one of the ECMs. This was a big one for us to have. We had um, energy management systems. We sort of had a little bit of everything in the buildings because what we were given during different school projects was not on the same platform. Through the Noresco project, we were able to narrow it down to two systems uh, that run the uh, energy management, which is the controls for the heating, ventilation, occupancy, uh, scheduling, and things of that nature. We also did weatherization and attic insulation uh, in a number of the buildings, town hall being one of them, um, fire stations, um, and just around, generally around all the buildings, replacing uh, weather stripping on doors. This is low hanging fruit, but you do lose a lot, a lot of energy in those areas. We also did another uh, ECM number six was energy efficient LED traffic signals for all the town owned um, traffic signals, uh, signals in town, um, which at the time was, I, I forget what the number was that we did, but we did quite a few of them in Reading. So we did do some solar. Um, we did solar domestic hot water at the two fire stations and the police station. As a, as a measure. We also did a solar uh, preheat uh, rooftop system, which is at the Performing Arts Center of the Reading Memorial High School, which is a, basically a giant duct bank that warms air up. And when the sun is on this duct bank, it pulls air and it's warmed up by the sun so that when the units that heat the library come on, they're not heating air that's coming in at 20 degrees, it's heating air that's like around 70 or 80 degrees. So that saves energy there. ECM number nine was replacing unit ventilators at um, and the engine was at the Killing Elementary School, which were antiquated. The boilers were newer, 
but we took all that old equipment out that was giving us problems and it got all taken care of over at that location. That was a big one. So we also did a steam to hot water conversion um, at the Birch Meadow uh, Elementary School. We put uh, natural gas fire condensing boilers in and we replaced all the HVs and the unit ventilators in that building. That was a that was a big project that got done as part of the performance contracting. We also did heating um, system upgrades. Um, we did, at the town hall we did new con condensing boilers at this location. We did a new steam boiler at the West Side Fire Station, new burners at the Joshua Eaton, and we did new burners at the Coolidge Middle School. Also out back here at the, um, at the town hall, we replaced an 80-ton air cooled chiller um, with a much smaller, I, I think it's around 55 tons of cooling we do this whole building with now, which is more efficient. It was way oversized for what we needed here. So this is what we were talking about. This is what kind of tells the story. This is the uh, verified savings for year eight. It was 408921 which exceeded the guaranteed savings of $380,000. And that just shows you the different energy conservation measures and how it all stacked up in dollars. And this slide just kind of shows you how they kind of calculate the uh, savings. You get your baseline utility costs in the first column there. Um, then during the EMS contract, there's the payment, which by doing the measures, the payment, um, the savings pays for the lease payment if you go that way, and then any additional savings on top, and then after the contract, over to your right. Any questions so far? Joe, can I ask you a quick question? Sure. With the, the like for example, that twenty-eight thousand dollars savings, how does that get shared, or do we? Is that all us? That's actually four hundred thousand savings, which is twenty-eight more than what was guaranteed. Sorry, it's the above the amount above the guarantee. The way the way we did it, since we didn't do the lease payment, was uh, in the early years. I sound old now. Um, <laughs> we used Bill left the room. Yeah, we used income five percent debt capital and added more so that we can pay the debt service for this with savings. Over time, and as time got tougher before the override passed, we just narrowed that down so that there wasn't really money being earmarked for this. So the since energy is an accommodated cost, it just flowed right through to the operating budgets for both the town and the schools. But at first, it was really dedicated to debt service, then it narrowed down. Yeah, so at this point... So it's been about $400,000 a year. Got it. it. And so the way it works is if it was below the 380 guarantee, they'd make good? They'd write a check, correct. Okay, and when it's above, we just we're, we're, we get it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. So we're gonna talk a little bit, these are some of the measures we did since the performance contracting initiative. Um, we installed new domestic hot water tanks um, over at the Barrows Elementary School that are insulated that weren't before. We did an LED lighting project at the uh, Birch Meadow um, Elementary School in the hallways and some classrooms. We also did high efficient condensing boilers and we did LED lighting in the hallways at the Eaton. At Coolidge, we did LED lighting in the gymnasium and high, efficient, high efficiency condensing uh, hot water boilers for domestic. We also did re a return air fan uh, installation at the Wood End School and we uh, installed high performance skylights over there. At the high school, we did uh, high efficiency condensing boilers, um, which was which just finished. We just finished that project, and we did LED lighting in the field house auditorium and assorted high hat LEDs on the hallways in Main Street. Tom Hall, this room is sitting in. We also did LED lighting in a lot of the common areas and conference rooms at the uh, Tom Hall. The DPW, which is uh, um, uses a lot of energy down there because of the nature of the work they do. We did LED lighting at the high bay garage, the mechanics bays, in the cold storage building, and we installed the high efficiency heat pump system in the um, dispatch area. Same thing at the police station, LED lighting in the common areas. We did uh, new high efficiency condensing boilers at Main Street Fire. We put a new roof uh, on the West Side Fire Station and insulated over there. Cemetery garage, um, new LED lighting in there in the shop areas and offices. And we also finished a, a job that we partnered up with DPW on uh, retrofitting 98 town owned streetlights to LED. We just finished that this year. 
So this is what Noresco is proposing, and none of these are, are actually in stone, but these are some of the potential projects that could be. And it's important to remember that the only thing we can do, <clears throat> we can't do anything that wasn't on the first, in the first contract. It has to be clearly spelled out, the buildings that were part of phase one. If we couldn't do another building unless it was on this list. So LED lightings, LED lighting improvements, renewable energy, solar PV, geothermal, we're gonna look at energy management system upgrades from what we have, high efficiency condensing hot water boilers, there's more to be done that we'd like to do, rooftop units, some of their aging that we could look at, energy efficient transformers, um, power factor correction, building weatherization, weatherization um, some pipe and fitting insul insulation, uh, plug load controls, computer power management, walk-in cooler controls, and high efficiency motors. So all those things will be looked at when they do what's called the investment grade audit. Um, this is some of the work that um, Noresco recently did at the Brain Tree Public Schools. They just threw a slide in there to show you some LED projects they did. And then some solar PVs projects they did. Um, um, and some geothermal down in Virginia. Any questions? Great. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for sending in advance. Yes, thank you very much for sending in advance. Um, so I may have missed it in the very, very beginning, but um, <coughs> did you mention how long our contract with Noresco lasts? The MNV is 15. Yeah, so it's 2025. Right. 2025. Uh, and at that point, we'll... Either, um, will we pursue another performance contract with the with them or some other? Um, you know, the decisions are ours, but they're obviously well aware of what's going on in our town and our buildings and our systems. Mm -hmm. So we can legally proceed with them now under the old contract. So that's the easiest option, if you will. Mm -hmm. We don't have to go through any other procurement process that way. Mm -hmm. And where, again, it wasn't low bid, that's much more reasonable than if you were trying to extend something that was low. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Go ahead. Um, how much, two questions related, how much do we work with RMLD on some of these activities? How much could we work with RMLD on some of these activities? I remember we invited RMLD into the first discussion and, and they just had a low amount of interest. And honestly, that's not as common on their uh, ability so much as um, grants were available that didn't include municipal owned light plants. So uh -huh. finances just didn't consider them as a party. I don't know if that's changed. That's something we need to learn as to how, yeah. how and whether they can participate more. So when, when end up keeping a small amount of money. Yeah, for the, for the LEDs. Uh, yeah. The, the thing is with um, ESCO, so our energy service contractors, is that they have the, uh, the bandwidth to be able to pull off a project of this size because they work with vendors they have a small group of vendors that they work that do their HVAC, that they do their plumbing, their electrical, and they're able to get in and out. They have a formula that works. And when I say that, I mean we were able to get boilers at the schools especially to get that work done over one summer was a huge undertaking. Um, you need a company that has like the, ma the, the manpower and the management to back that up, if you will, that can do that. Yep. Um, and an ESCO, you know, the ESCOs have the ability to do that. So. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually thinking a different way. So one of the, I was at the RMLD meeting last night. <laughs> one of their big pushes is electrification as a way to uh, kind of rebuild some of their, their lost things. Mm -hmm. And the world has changed enough at this point that we can save energy and shift to electric in some cases. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're banking on. That, that I think may be how their, their load either stays consistent or, or can go up in the future. So I would imagine that they might have interest not in um, doing the contracts, uh, not getting in the way of that, mm -hmm. but in seeing them happen, participating in a different way uh, because it meets their needs really well uh, going into the future. Whereas in the past, maybe it didn't mm -hmm. because it was lost for them. Now it actually may be changing into gain. And I, I think it's worth talking to them about how to do that and, and just see what their interest is. Maybe that gets wrapped into the development. Maybe it does. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we asked them last time when I'm out. Obviously, I always have to ask them. Just yeah. Know what's up. It was a big discussion last night. Okay. Other questions? Um, 
Yeah, um, sure. A couple more baseline uh, questions, Joe. Um, so as, as, as Bob said, and I, and I totally agree, the best use, uh, the best bet is to use less energy and that'll reduce our costs. Um, so have we, um, has NESCO done or have we done, do we know the R uh, value level of insulation in different buildings and, um, and what the cost benefit would be of upping the R value, that is the insulation value. So for example, uh, we're putting in a system at Coolidge this summer. Um, if if we know the R value rating and if it could be increased, then we might not need such a large system to, to, to go in. So does NESCO have that um, information? Yeah, our value, value. Needs the whole Okay. It means it, so when yeah. I, I can tell you that when we design new, when we do new roof systems, if you want to talk about like insulation, that's like a where you have a huge heat loss is going right up through the roof. Right. So a lot of the new roofing systems per code have to uh, have a certain thickness of the tapered insulation for the roof system. Yeah. So that is always looked at. Um, so but an overall R value for the building Nesco doesn't do. I'm, I'm confused what you mean by an overall R value for the building. This was, I, I, it's so funny, I had the same question. Um, so the R value of the actual insulation, can we be using insulation with a higher R value to improve the insulation overall? Not, so not of the whole building, obviously, but of the actual insulation that's being, or um, the actual insulation that's being used. So many of the buildings that have attics in them have been insulated as part of the first phase of the project. I will tell you that. And I don't know the number, but I can find out. I can answer the board back on that question. But like I said, when there's a new construction project going on, like at the Reading Public Library, or we're doing a new roof system, that's always looked at so that we yes. you know, get a better energy savings. Uh, um, the, from the perspective I was looking at it is, you know, to your point about Coolidge putting in this new heating system, if we have better quality insulation, do we need as big a heating system because there's less loss? So is well, that something to that's be, taken? To be quite frank with you, we're actually downsizing the size of the boilers at the, at the, uh, at the Coolidge Middle School. So what we're doing over there, just I think there's been some confusion maybe about what exactly it is we're doing. That building is a steam heat building. It's, it was built in 1957 or 58? No, it was built in 61. 61, there you go, see? <laughs> John was there. Yeah, John was there. Sold me. <laughs> so when that building was originally built, it was all steam heat, and they renovated it in 1997, 98. And, yep, and then they added a, 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 about 30,000 square feet onto the building, and we have a steam to hot water converter that provides hot water heat to the back of the building. It's very inefficient because you have to, you know, obviously, if you're making steam heat, you have to build a lot of energy to do that. What we're doing is putting a condensing boiler in. We're going to take the heat exchanger out, and we're going to put a conde three condensing boilers that are small. They're like the size of three large refrigerators, and they're going to heat that rear section of the building, which means we don't have to run those two giant boilers that are in the, uh, in the uh, boiler room to heat the rear section. And a condensing boiler, the way it runs, is much more efficient than a, a normal hydronic boiler. So that's what we're doing there. So we're going to be, believe it or not, downsizing. And another example of that is at the high school, we took one of the large Cleaver Brooks boilers offline and put three condensing, four condensing boilers in their place. And we can run the whole high school off of two of those, just to give you an idea. Mm. So insulation is important, but it's also sizing the equipment correctly. And that's what they'll do when they come in and look at the, when they do the investment grade audit mm -hmm. to make sure. Great, thank you. Um, and I know that RMLD has rebates on heat pumps and you've experimented with, you've already installed some uh, um, geothermal heat pumps? No geothermal. No, no geothermal? No. Okay. No. Uh, what were they, the heat pumps? These are small split systems that you'd see mm -hmm. like in classrooms or in office areas and mm -hmm. we put uh, heat pumps in like at the DPW that has um, the dispatch area down there. So there was an older style heat pump system in there we put a newer style in there mm -hmm. that provides heating and air conditioning in there. But that's on a small scale mm -hmm. for that. Yeah. Um, the heat pumps to the best of my knowledge and, and we are going to look into it to see is that they don't they don't heat as well down below 30 degrees like right. the boiler would. Mm -hmm. um, 
and they don't offer the same output um, as a boiler would. Like it's in a household application, it's good, but you're only talk you're talking about a large commercial building. So if the technology exists that we can use heat pump technology, we'll do it. But I remember as part of the first phase, we looked at taking up the front of town hall, for instance, and going geothermal. I don't remember the exact number, but the payback was on the order of 80 plus years. Uh, and New England is not the best location 10 years ago for this technology. Obviously, we'll look and see what's changed. Um, again, that's to my earlier comments. Maybe we don't need to look at everything on the payback, pure financial issue, and we'll come to that discussion, certainly. Um, so just to follow on that for a sec, so I think you've heard um, from this board, I think some other boards as well, that there's interest in, in looking at what the opportunities are in other forms of energy, so solar uh, photovoltaic as well as geothermal, um, to understand what is the, the state of the technology, and as we talked about, maybe there are other parties that might have interest in, in supporting it, and, and just to kind of keep that in, uh, in view, and, and I think um, and one of the things that came up at town meeting was, was kind of, and you, you described nicely what, kind of what's going on and why, it is a notion that we want to be thinking forward a little bit. And so now is a great time to be doing that, just to make sure that it's part of the discussion. And if there are areas where it works, that's great. And if there are areas where it doesn't, so be it. I think building on that, the, the concept of electric vehicles, where we, uh, not just RMLD, but other um, organizations are looking to use electric vehicles more. Um, it's a unique situation with the town because you put a lot of miles on these vehicles. So are there vehicles within our fleet that can be upgraded? Um, and what does that mean from a broader perspective as far as maintenance? Um, and is it practical? Is it beyond just the cost effectiveness of it? So, um, I think Eric's done somewhere. Um, yeah, I think the awesome. W visited uh, FinCom a month and a month and a half ago and discussed that. Just the quick summary was two or three years from now that might be possible, but the technology's not there today mm -hmm. for municipal vehicles. Um, well, and if that's the case then, and it is a, a direction we plan on um, pursuing down the line, are there efforts that we can make now to start thinking about the installation of the infrastructure needed as far as charging stations? And is that incorporated into the plan so that once we're, once the technology is ready, we're prepared for it from an infrastructure perspective? Yeah. Yeah. Um, if I could tack on to that, yeah. um, just to interrupt for one second. Um, I mean, the technology is already here for many people in town who have electric EV vehicles. And um, I think one of the things that came out of town meeting and instructional motions was um, to invest in these sorts of technologies. And is it possible to um, install some EV charge, charging stations in a couple of places around town so that we encourage, number one, this uh, type of technology, make it friendlier to the residents who have EV, 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 EV electric vehicles. Electric yeah. vehicles, thank you. I was going to have to say <laughs> EV vehicles, but that doesn't work. Um, I know, and then to maybe also uh, make the downtown and Reading more of an attraction to people who have EV vehicles, and um, yeah. Um, that discussion uh, has been added to the downtown phase two uh, project. Mm -hmm. uh, just to recap, downtown improvements are water, sewer, stormwater, and above ground. Yeah. The first three are first, obviously. Uh, the above ground is probably a year and a half away, but that's part of that discussion for sure. I would also suggest, you know, at our last meeting, we had the great presentation from Julie about the parking and how the goal there is to completely revamp our parking downtown. So as part of that, it would be nice if we could identify areas that, while we may not be able to install the charging stations within the next six months, or six to nine months, which is what we're shooting for for that overhaul, to at least incorporate the potential for that down the line. So that when we want to, we already know where the spaces will be. Um, moving away from electric vehicles, but still on energy, um, what efforts does the town make, uh, you know, RMLD sends up a <coughs> repeat 
alerts. Um, for those of you watching at home, you can sign up for them on the RMLD website, rmld.com. They'll send you an email to let you know when you need to decrease energy use, uh, especially in the summer months. What is the town doing um, to support that effort? I'm not sure I understand the question. Is this a facilities related issue? Or so the, the idea when, when RMLD sends out those short the peak effort um, right. alerts, it's when there's an anticipation, again, especially in the summer um, with air conditioner use particularly high, um, to do things like not run your dishwasher, don't run your pool filters, don't plug in your electric vehicles, wait until after peak hours, um, just at 8 p 7 or 8 p.m. Um, does the town have something similar to try and decrease our energy usage during those peak times? I, I guess uh, it circles back to a few years back when they were going to offer two rates, uh, one for people who would use more energy on peak. Um, the town didn't qualify because schools are closed during the summer, so they just kind of took us off that discussion because that's our biggest energy use and it doesn't we don't have air conditioning in the schools generally and it doesn't run in the summer so that, that's the biggest savings that would happen mm -hmm. um, i'm not sure there's too much more that would go on in the summer in the remaining buildings that are open that would matter we don't have any dishwashers and so forth um, I don't know, you have you have master controls to take care of all the energy efficiency um, I don't yeah, know in, the in a lot of and there, there are certain programs that are run during the summer months that it would be very difficult where there are air conditioned spaces to deprive the, the people that are in the programs without the AC, the children that are in the program. So mm -hmm. it's kind of difficult to do that in a school mm -hmm. or, or a library building. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. You know? Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? All right. Oh, uh, is there anyone in the audience that, like, yes, Karen? Uh, sure, Karen Eric, um, <coughs> from the Finance Committee. Uh, I was just trying to clarify, I've been hearing that uh, the town was about to renegotiate the Moresco contract, but it sounds more like just determine what phase two is going to consist of. Is that what is more accurate? Um, the timeline I laid out was this five steps. The first step might be completed by August, September and really no decisions are made at that point. The decisions are after that. And that's under the existing Noresco contract. So phase two, those were all like what ifs? Those are like, here's a list of things that could happen in phase two of our contract. So, so theoretically, again, if we move on that schedule sometime next fall, then the community can have a discussion with the school committee select board anyone else as to, you know, here's some of the options, what do you think? So that's when that would come in. Um, and the, uh, the portables, which are now heat-pump driven, is that correct? The portable classrooms? We're getting a few more. Are they all heat, air source heat pumps? Yes. Uh, is Noresco going to help you manage those as well? Because they're sort of attached to those schools, or are those excluded? No, those would not be under the performance contracting because it's not they're not listed on the they list, were, so, were, so to speak. You know what I mean? It's yeah. yeah. But those are really small. Those are only what how many times of cooling in each one of those, Kevin? Five or six times. Four, four, four or five times of cooling. Those are small. Each one, each one. Yeah, each classroom. I mean, we're starting to build some momentum in town. I was unaware of the DPW heat pump. So now we've got like a number of portable heat pumps. Are those going to be the ones that you can technology going, which is great. Um, one of the things I was wondering is Bob has offered to get the Climate Activity Committee involved in this process um, so that um, we can have better communication about what kind of renewables that the, the board and, and the residents are looking for can come out of this process. How do, how do you see that? That's the community discussion I just mentioned uh, starting sometime late next summer, early this fall. It would, make, it would make sense to have someone involved while they're doing that. I don't energy think audit. so because no decisions are made or options are even examined until that time. We're just figuring out what is it that we want to measure in order to do the energy audit. What are we looking to measure again? And then there's the discussion about, okay, what do we think about these results? Where can we make changes? What would the changes be? That seems to be a sensible time for, for them and others to participate. Okay, so just um, just the green communities option the application is mid-october mm -hmm. and then audit is the first step one of the first steps of the application there's a lot of synergies to it so um, 
And, and just to be clear about the, the audit, um, the audit is free if we do it through the resco and continue to work with them. If it weren't, then a grant would certainly be welcome. Well, it's part of the application process, so you would have to get funds for something else. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Mm -hmm. okay. Vanessa, I, yes. I had uh, two, two, um, two points. Uh, Joe, you're, you're right. Heat pumps only handle a certain temperature range, and, range, and in the coldest uh, days, they can't cut it. But they certainly do um, reduce the need for, um, um, say, a gas-fired system. Um, so I was hoping that that uh, to see s some of that analysis. So this might answer, answer some of your questions about that. So mm -hmm. what what the investment grade audit is, um, the IGA, is a um, information dump that happens between my department and the RESCO. Mm -hmm. We give them again. You know, we're going to give them all of our utility information, which luckily they already have all of it. We're going to give them an updated asset inventory of all of our um, the things that have changed since 2009, what's been replaced, what's on the horizon for replacements, and what our thoughts were to replace things. Mm -hmm. What they do is they go through and they look they look at everything that we have and put uh, data loggers on the equipment to see how much energy for a particular piece of equipment is uh, consuming, if you will. And then they go ahead and they give us a. Um, something called an IntelliChoice model, or we call it the deal board. And mm -hmm. basically this deal board is, is every energy conservation measure that I showed you folks, but it's by building. And it says, okay, if we do comprehensive LED lighting at all 15 locations, or 14 on the, 14 is what's covered, here's, how much, here's what it's gonna do, and then we're gonna add in some solar if we wanted to, as an example. Um, some uh, solar uh, PV, some geothermal possibly. But they'll put everything in there and what the whole idea is to get down to the savings, pay for it. Mm -hmm. So that there's a, uh, it's budget neutral if you will. Mm -hmm. And if you put certain things, let's say we wanted to add windows. We put windows in a town hall as part of performance contract and the payback was 120 years. It, it, killed, it killed the payback. Mm -hmm. We took it off because we did that under our own capital plan. But the audit spells all that stuff out very clearly and shows you where the savings are being driven from, and it's it's a it's a balance between you know what can work and what can't really work. Yeah. Um, but nothing's off the table. It's just that we need to have them do the audit, and it's it takes them six to eight months to do this particular process. Mm. So. We are we are making decisions though as we. That's your point of August, September being the decisions. They put everything they can possibly think of on the table. Right. Yeah. Including you know, using a system this way part of the year and that way part. Of right. The year. That's all on the table. Mm -hmm. I guess what I'm saying is we're we're making decisions. I assume without them. Uh, by installing new burners and things like that, uh, for instance, at Coolidge. Uh, not really, no, because the condensing boilers are what was in the performance contracting initiative. Mm -hmm. That's following right along with Noresco's whole mantra. That's what we did. LED lighting, boom. Mm -hmm. we, and, we, and that's the last one on the capital plan right. pending another round of performance contracting. Yep. So there is no work scheduled that would sort of violate whatever we decide in the future. Excuse me. One, one more thing to keep yeah. in mind. They come out once a year and they visit us. Yeah. They come into my office and they crawl around our buildings once a year. They do. They, because they want to make sure that they're, they're protecting their investment. Yeah. That we're doing what we're supposed to do. Yeah. That we're maintaining our equipment. So why would you spend... See, it, it's, it seems crazy, but why would you spend $5 million and not maintain the equipment? Yeah. There's yeah. a question from the audience. So, I, I get it. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, Go ahead, Karen. Thank you. Just uh, one more comment. I'm not sure everyone here knows the, the Met at Reading Station. That's an electrified air source. I believe it's air source. Air source heat pump driven building. They did not pull a gas line. I, I'm surprised you're still hearing that heat pumps don't work down to zero because that's not what my installers told me. And all those people are like, that will build it. That's like a commercial building. So maybe you'll hear something if you're Okay. So, so that leads to another question, which is that, so they come in and make sure we're maintaining the equipment properly, but the recommendations that they made that resulted from the audit, presumably in 2009, mm -hmm. does that evolve with time and technology? Or is it, we have the contract with them for, you said 15 years? 
and at that point, because because technology on the sustainability front is evolving very rapidly, and so the recommendations that were made in 2019, 2009, 2010, some of those may not be the best by what the standards are today. So is, how does that work? Let me try and then you correct me. <laughs> okay. um, put yourself in the Resco's shoes. They have to guarantee money to the town if this doesn't work. So they have an extensive model and a baseline measure. When Joe's department makes other improvements because the technology is, uh, has improved and is there, that doesn't count for energy savings for Nuresco's purpose. That's something we've chosen to do above and beyond performance contracting. So they're still measuring what they started out with, but we're still improving the way maybe you've suggested. Okay. They have to fix it in time for themselves for their own purposes, and we don't have to stop. So it's in their best interest to amend their proposals? So it's that in their best interest to them. come out and inspect every year because their money is on the book if energy savings doesn't happen. So they want to make sure all this stuff that was agreed to at the start is being done properly. To the extent that Joe's done something else that saves twenty-five thousand um, dollars, and the and the consumption shows that we don't get credit in terms of the performance contract for that, because that was not something that they did at the time. I, I think I, I understand. So we have the flexibility to yes. go above and beyond, Correct. and and okay, we don't get credit, but we get the twenty five grand in savings. Credit in the real world, just e yeah, so right, 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 right. So we do have some flexibility. That's good yeah. to hear. But that puts the onus on us to come up with those incremental changes, right? Yes. And yeah. so I guess the advantage of doing this audit sooner than later is that we'll get the benefit of them doing it in real time. Right. So sooner is better than later. Okay. Right. Any other questions? All right. Joe, this was great. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you Joe. Thanks, Joe. All right. So we're a little ahead of schedule. Uh, and Say we that again. I, I, I don't <laughs> think I Say it again, again please, too. Um, Wait, let me guess what. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Joe. Um, Choose with us in spirit. All right. So we, we actually. We're going to just take a five minute break.
<laughs> oh, wait. All right, we're back in session. Uh, we're a little ahead of schedule, folks, so we have about 10 minutes before we can open the hearing. Um, with that time, why don't we revisit, um, I don't know, 10 minutes isn't enough to do. Minutes. Once, yeah, let's give minutes. Okay. So, Kaylin, I just had one minor edit, which is that when we reference TIPS training, yep, should be capitalized because it's an acronym. Okay, but that's all I had. Um, so let's have a motion, actually, in my fault. I can do it. Move that the select board approve the meeting minutes of November 19th, 2019, as amended. Great. Uh, is there a second? Second. Okay. Further discussion? Anybody else? Okay. Uh, all those in favor? And we still have eight minutes. <laughs> so, this is a very unusual position for us. Yes, Bob? Um, if you want to talk about your January uh, retreat or whatever opportunity, yes. I don't know if that's a worthwhile eight minutes. Why don't, yes, we will absolutely do that. Uh, and I'm also going to suggest that we talk about, in these eight minutes, office hours for January. Oh, yes. Which we, um, to John's point, have been a little negligent on. Um, so if we want to take a look at the calendar and see when and where we would like to have office hours. I know John has been doing the monthlies at the Senior Center. At 11? Hmm? 11. Uh, I'm not sure what, I, I do believe that they're at 11. I don't know what day. I think it's the second Tuesday. Like that sounds right. Um, so I think that's great. Now, do we want to consider doing one at the library? Sure. Uh, and maybe it, instead of doing them one off, if we make some regularity, it, it'll make it a little bit more predictable for people and say the second Tuesday of every, the first, or sorry, the first Saturday, or the second Saturday of every month. Yeah. Working um, around, you know, any holidays that might exist. I offered to take one of the um, 11 o'clock senior center okay. um, ones. I, I haven't done one of the uh, office hours in a while, so mm -hmm. I'd be happy to take the January one. January 4th so first Saturday. Can I also haven't done one in a while, so if you'd like me to do the if we're doing the first Saturday of the month, I could take. I'll do February? Yep, so that would be February 1st. Um, yeah, it'd be February 1st and January 4th. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Bob, if you can so add those in. So Vanessa would, on the 4th and Ann on the 1st. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And let's say, let's make I'll it. Check with the just to make sure. Yeah, we yes. need to have. So I actually did it in the map room, which was sorry, very nice and easy. MAP map or MAP map. Okay. Yes, not M A T H. Yeah. <laughs> um, nine thirty or nine? How did you do it? Nine thirty. Okay, great. Yeah. Let's do nine thirty to ten thirty. Okay. Uh, and then, who would like to do March seventh? Mark, would March you like 7th. to do that one? Sure. Uh, and then we'll revisit for April following the election. So 9.30 uh, at the library, March 7th. Okay, perfect. Yeah, we still have six minutes. I'll so circle back to confirm those dates and times are fine with the library. Okay. Uh, agenda for the retreat. Yes. Can, before we go there, sure. are we, so this is suggesting that we'd have one office hour per month? Mm -hmm. That's what it was before. <laughs> it was, okay. We Why did I think it was more regular? It was every other meeting. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, I, I don't like the term retreat. I realize this is picky, but uh, for Charge. our January session, what? Charge. Yeah, uh, exactly. retreat. <laughs> That's <a> bad dad joke, <laughs> Mark. <laughs> I am what I am. Uh, all right, so as far as agenda topics, you know, we've, we've talked about numerous items. Uh, a couple of months ago that we may want to tackle. And a lot of them are um, the 
less about the nitty gritty of the town work and more about philosophically we, where we want to be headed, if there are efficiencies within the meetings that we want to handle, um, you know, even simple things, seemingly smaller things like do we vote to approve everything on the warrant or are there only certain pertinent things that we want to. Um, so with our four minutes remaining before we can start the hearing, are there things that we would, that you'd want to sort of throw on the table that we could potentially tackle in within a couple of hours or add to the list that are not everyday topics? Things that we don't have time for. Can I ask a question? Is, sure. is this title reasonable or do you want to suggest another? That's what's been there for a little while. What is it? Let's, let's leave that Select in there for now. strategy discussion on objectives, priorities, and time frame. Why don't we leave it there, and then once we determine what the agenda is, we can narrow that down. Okay. So is that for um, like goal setting um, prior, you know, prior? It, it can be goal setting. Because we wanted to revisit the goals and maybe reprioritize. Mm -hmm. We can add new ones. I mean, you know, Mark's point, you, you had your, your statement about things you wanted to discuss. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I think it's valid where... Yeah. I think it has to start higher level. The, the mission isn't to walk in and talk about last year's objectives. The mission is to figure out how do we make the board better focused, what are our priorities, what do we want to get done, and better ways to do it. That's to me the number one objective for this thing. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think that dovetails though with, with the, the goals that we can establish for ourselves. What do we want to accomplish this year? And that will help focus us. Um, I, I, but yes, mm -hmm. I'm thinking it's more how we work together. Uh -huh. And then what should come from that is what we want to work on. But I think how we work together is, is the first level that I'm, I, I think we don't have time during these meetings to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and just kind of how that goes. And, and even I think that the, the communication that's now uh, happening uh, happening and not happening. That's the discussion we should have also. Not the policy of communication, mm -hmm. but what it is that we want to make sure is, is flowing. So the last couple of weeks, Bob, this I think has been great. I, I felt like there's a lot more stuff coming. I think that's the kind of stuff that we ought to talk about, just make sure that we're, we're aligned. I think one of the things that I've experienced this year as chair is that there are the nitty gritty, we have to do the licenses, we have to appoint people to yeah. board, things like that, right? Uh, it's the administrative tasks of the board that, that we are responsible for. Yeah. Um, you know, Andy, I think your point about the goals is an important one. I also think there's singular, singular year goals and then there's long-term goals, right. right? I think sustainability is one of those. Mm -hmm. I think the downtown, the South Main Street development area is one of those goals. And those are not things that we're going to have, like the administrative duties that require a one-time 20 minutes on the agenda. Right. We need an hour to have a philosophical conversation mm -hmm. about it. And every year, potentially, the board could change. So there needs to be some kind of structure, or understanding, or culture on the board that says, you know, every March we talk about X mm -hmm. or twice a year. And that needs to be conversations that happen separate from all of our administrative tasks, which yeah. means additional meetings because the, the agendas mm -hmm. get filled up very quickly with what is required of us. And if we want to have those long term conversations, they need to happen separately. So I'd like to see that formalized, not in policy, but in practice. Mm -hmm. I think um, for the retreat because we don't have another word for the charge. <laughs> um, I would love to have this have kind of a less formal setting. I don't know if we we talked about maybe not having it televised, but certainly still pop, uh, posted and open mm -hmm. to the public. But to allow for a less formal conversation, I thought maybe maybe we could have dinner together. Um, you know, break bread together. I think that's always a nice way. I, to you of don't want me eating when we're having these discussions. <laughs> I just. I think sometimes sharing a meal together can yeah. can be a nice way of yeah. of, of of sharing. So. Um, and I don't know if we. I has, know. Has to be in a public building. Has to be in a public building. Publicly so available space. Mm -hmm. A publicly available space. So, so but so. not town, necessarily town owned. Doesn't technically have to be town. So okay. one board did it at Jordan's conference. Right. That's. Yeah. I remember you'd mentioned that. Um, How about a, a room at a restaurant? You can do that, but the public has to be welcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yes. 
Uh, let's not pass up Jordans too quickly. They have an ice cream place <laughs> in there. That you, yeah, uh, traffic. It's a good point. Uh, well, yeah, no, thank you. But, um, I, you know, what brings the people rest. together like ice cream? Um, Just a thought. It's a good okay. point. So, uh, one other thought. Um, uh, I, I remember, I was at Mark who had originally brought this idea, that, and it was at Wakefield who had done this, and they had some kind of facilitator. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. could, could we, should we have a facilitator? I would very much like that. Yeah. Because it's definitely hard to participate mm -hmm. in a conversation when you're trying to manage it. Yes. Sure. Um, and, but January 7th is, is, or whatever that date is, is sort of around the corner. Mm -hmm. So, um, if we're going to, do we, actually that's a great place to start, do we have anyone that could act as a facilitator? We have facilitators we have that are professional in town. Field, but I don't know if that's appropriate for you. Yeah. She may not feel comfortable. I would love to have her. I think she'd be fabulous, but I don't know if she's I would have no problem, but she may not feel comfortable. Yeah. I don't know. Right. And that would, yeah, that would be fair. I can yeah. talk. You can ask her. Yeah, if she's I'll comfortable ask. with it, great. If not, then yeah, I... That sounds great yeah. Yeah. from yeah. our, right? I think looking at around, uh, around the uh, table, that's great yeah. from our perspective if, if she were comfortable okay. with that. If she is not, do we have a plan B? We gently discussed asking Alan Foles. Oh. As a possibility too. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. We have, I, I don't. I haven't spoken with him. I, I, sorry, Al. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's, al he's already hired. He's already paid. Uh, yeah. We, we, we could offer him what's a, to lose. A, a uh, doubling so if he does it. I'm happy to reach out to Alan if that's depending on what. Yeah. Okay. Why don't you do that anyways? Then we'll both. Have yep. Okay. Um, a third possibility um, that I haven't pursued is. Um, the moderator of a different town. Yep. Do we know? We could sort of reach out to our counterparts and see who has a good. I do know someone who would be oh, very I good. Which town? Wakefield. Which, okay, I was going to say North Reading used to be the moderator here. So many, oh, many years ago. Yeah, uh, that, that's <laughs> fine too. I, I know. I can um, ask around. I know the gentleman in Wakefield. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it looks like we have a list of potential facilitators. Three deep seems sufficient. Hopefully, one will be able to come through for us. We would need to provide that person with our agenda fairly soon so that we could, um, so they would know what to prepare. Uh, so we are now are able to start the hearing and, and we have our staff in the audience, so I, I don't want to keep them here any longer than we have to. Uh, Bob, could I ask you, I know our next three meetings are budget based. Yep. Um, but can we add this to further hash out the agenda sure. sooner rather than later? Yeah. I don't know about tomorrow's when we'll presentation. When on that liquor question earlier. So, mm. so let's, that. given that that may happen later, perhaps if there's time tomorrow. Oh, we can't post for tomorrow. Nope. The following no. Tuesday. Sorry, yeah. Okay. Uh, great. So now we have a hearing. You have a motion. Lovely. I Thank do. you. Ready? Yep. Uh, to the inhabitants of the town of Reading, please take notice that the select board of the town of Reading will hold a series of public hearings on December 3rd, 2019 at 9.30 p.m. in the select board's meeting room, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Massachusetts, to amend Article 5.2.1, add to the end of Paragraph 4, the Reading Residence of Housing Projects developed under MGL Chapter 40R or 40B do not qualify from the above exemption regarding the employee parking sticker no charge passes. Amend Article 5.2, add to the end of Paragraph 8, the Reading residents of housing projects under MGL Chapter 40R or 40B do not qualify for the above exemption regarding the Reading Community Access Sticker No Charge Passes. A copy of the proposed document regarding this topic is available in the Town Manager's Office, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Massachusetts, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday from 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., Tuesday from 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m., and will be in the Select Board packet on the website at www.reddingma.gov. All interested parties are invited to attend the hearing or may submit their comments in writing or by email prior to 4 p.m. on December 3rd, 2019 to townmanager at ci.reading.ma.us per order of Robert W. Lelasher, town manager. Wonderful. So, Bob, we're handing it over to you. Sure. Or? Uh, I'll give you an overview. We have uh, Officer Scott and Lieutenant Amandola as questions may arise. Um, just to take a, a step back, on January 21st, our objective is to come in and talk to the board um, as a PTTF. Um, you know, we heard you loud and clear that the downtown parking issue, you'd like to solve it quicker. 
uh, rather than doing it in March or April. So we're going to come into you in January 21st as if the board is available and willing to have a significantly long discussion. I put an hour and a half on the agenda. We'll see. Um, the reason I bring this up is what is tonight is a short-term fix for what a longer-term solution might be, one small part. Um, it's clear to me, um, as, a, as an outsider to a lot of this process, having worked with Julie Mercier recently, um, a lot of the wording needs cha to be changed just to be clearer. So much like we've done the zoning bylaws, the general bylaws, the charter, and so forth, this document needs work. We didn't want to tackle that tonight, so we just wanted to close what I think are two loopholes. Um, when, this, when these exceptions were created and free parking, if you will, was given out, it was for single-family homes in the downtown area so that they could have neighbors and guests visit them and not have other people parking in front of their house that had a pass, for, mm. for instance, to the train station area. So people that lived near the train station um, qualified for these free stickers and they could park on the street that's otherwise signed stickers only otherwise you couldn't park in front of your own house um, it was certainly never imagined uh, that um, 40R and 40B projects would qualify for free parking but technically right now they do we've had one 40R residential developed on Haven Street they never asked they have underground parking they have more parking than they needed um, so the question just never came through. But as since since the PTTF um, came in to meet with you folks in the fall, we've met almost every week to prepare ourselves for January. And this is just one of the discoveries that this is a loophole. We'd really like the board, uh, if, if you will, a loophole to close before January 1st. Because technically, um, if you don't make these changes, residents of the 40B and 40R projects could come in and ask for free parking stickers. Now, what does that get you? Well, the board has changed what the sticker means over the years, so it doesn't get you access to the compost center. But there is parking more than just in the downtown that this would be eligible for, for instance, the tennis courts. Um, so there are different sections of town that this sticker would potentially allow someone to park in. And again, all the developers were highly aware of two different sets of rigorous processes, depending on if it's 40R or 40B, to provide ample resident parking so that there really should be no call for resident parking. And the two amendments in front of you are simply to close that off to those projects for now. So just to clarify, mm -hmm. because you said a resident parking and visitor parking, and these are different things, right? So, so resident parking should exist within the development. You know you are allocated one or two spots, depending yep. on your arrangement with, with the property owner. Mm -hmm. um, and you as a tenant or, or condo owner. But the visitor one presents a different situation. So, so the way that works is I, the homeowner, put my car with a sticker out on the street and my visitors use my driveway. That's how you accommodate visitor parking. For a single family home? For a single family home. How do we accommodate visitor parking for these developments? That's their problem. That's again, that's both the ZBA and the CPDC went through processes. They require a certain amount of parking. They are on site. They provided those spaces. Will that work? No one knows till it happens. But again, um, certainly the um, one on Haven Street has worked. But it's also difficult to say because of the public parking right behind there. So, but from from my knowledge, the parking garage has extra spaces and always has since they opened. So there's not been a problem. Um, I, I don't. I can't go through chapter and verse of the 40 Bs and 40 Rs currently, but they did go through the requirements for X number of visitor spaces. So this change, um, because you said the Haven Street uh, 40 R never requested these, this change would not result in the revocation of Correct. any passes. Correct. But it would also shut them off as well as anyone else. Mm -hmm. Right, but just to be clear, it shuts them off from free sticker. Correct. They have access the way any other resident in exactly. town does to buy a sticker. Yes, that's correct. So I think it makes it more consistent. And then, depending on what we finally present to you uh, in January, and it may take some time for you to decide, this may or may not become a moot point. But for now, since January 1st was approaching, we thought it was just important to close it off. So to clarify, though, it means that people living in these buildings, once they are established, will be treated differently than single-family homeowners in the same area. For the for the free stickers, yes, they will not get a free sticker. 
Right. Is there any concern from a legal perspective that we are potentially discriminating against people living in these developments? No, because again, the developments have provided parking for residents and guests. And if they didn't, then that's worse. Well, they did. It's a question of did they do enough, and time will tell. There's a formula they have to There's follow. There's absolutely a formula that each right. board used. And again, depending on the clients that move in, um, you know, and the friends they have, you know, that may or may not work. Um, from our past experience, somewhat to my surprise, uh, more parking than has been necessary has been provided mm -hmm. uh, for some of these projects in our town and some of our neighbors. Yeah. So cars are just becoming less less of a thing with some of these, uh, especially on transit-oriented development. Yeah, I just saw someone walk from the train from the train and walk across the street and go right into the Met, you know, so yeah. I don't know if that person even has a car. Any other thoughts? I'm comfortable with this. Yeah, I am too. Hey, I miss. No, I think you probably um, About half right now, about half the residents take advantage of the free stickers. And so we get a lot of employees complaining, like, I can't park there and I bought the pass, but these homeowners park there all day. So I think we're just trying to avoid that, especially down on High Street, where I think it would be the most prevalent of the now. Yeah. Is it possible that, I guess anything is possible, with looking at the overhaul of the entire parking system, that this, this benefit might be taken away from the single family? It, it is possible. I, I don't really remember if we've discussed it that much, other than to put it on the table. Right, we started to jump forward. I don't think we've really got too far. Okay. To clarify, these, what are they called, Reading Community Access Stickers? Mm -hmm. What do they get a resident? So they are able to park anywhere in the downtown area? There's different places around town, the downtown being the biggest area, that are designated as resident only at certain hours. So it gets you that. Uh, it used to also get you a combo center. Now, that's okay. So it's that they don't get ticketed and confused for commuters? Cor correct like for the downtown especially. But then in an area like the Birch Meadow Tennis Courts, you don't park in someone's front yard uh, unless you at least have a sticker. So again, past boards have had different discussions about the pros and cons of all that as well. Um, but the point is that the free stickers were really meant for the downtown people or the couple of other people that had, you know, for instance, you're in the Birch Meadow area in the tennis courts, same thing. You, you own a house, you get a free sticker, you park in front of your house, your guests park in your driveway. Otherwise, tennis patrons might be parking in front of your house and you wouldn't have a space to use because it's marked resident only. Okay. So we're only working on the downtown area, but just so you are aware, there are a few other areas in town. I, from my knowledge, is there always a athletic recreation locations? That's pretty much the residents that ask us, yeah. yes. Okay. So, The implication here is that if you live in a development in these particular areas, you cannot do what single family homeowners do, which is park in the street and have your guests park in your parking spot or driveway equivalent, right? I mean, that's. Well, in theory, the guests have other designated spots, and you at your single family house may not have that option. You know, many, if you look at, I think there's two houses that have no parking at all. Gold Street. Yeah, Gold Street. But generally speaking, you might fit two cars in most of these driveways at most. And many people own two cars, so there really is no guest parking for a single family. Um, this allows them to slide against slide a car out and have some visit. And, and but it, again, in theory, the 40R and 40B <coughs> have provided guest parking somehow on site. We're still a little uncomfortable with the fact that we're treating people who are living in apartments differently than we're treating people who are homeowners. I'm not sure I can fully follow that. I, I, I get your I get your point, um, but 
I, I get your point. I mean, th there's on this on the face of it, it does. It's, it's treating people differently based on whether they rent or have a condo or own a home. Um, and 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 uh, that said, um, I think that um, yeah, I've looked at a number of these uh, developments and how many cars they have to allot for their um, residents and. Um, it, 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 it's not the same as someone who has a short driveway. For instance, if my house were on down by uh, the, the train station, um, we'd be, I'm, I was about to use an, improper, an inappropriate word, we'd be in trouble. Um, <laughs> um, you know, because I've got three adult kids, they, they come home every once in a while, and um, and they have friends over, and um, where would we park? You know, my driveway only takes like two cars, unless, yeah, pretty much two cars. Um, and I think that's true for a number of the residents down uh, around that area. And the, tr the same would be true, though. So you're, I mean, the idea here is that if you purchase a home, that has only space for one car or two, and you yeah. have four people over, the town is giving you an allowance because mm -hmm. your driveway is limited. If you are an apartment, in an apartment, yeah. however, and you are allocated the space designated by the developer, which is one space, possibly two, mm -hmm. um, we're saying that this request is saying that they are not allowed the same flexibility. But those apartments have will typically spots. have fewer, will have guest spots, but you'll have fewer bedrooms. The fewer the likelihood of fewer people in that abode versus a single family home that has a multi bedroom. I and see also, your discomfort. The, the other piece is that you can, I believe, you can, as part of either a lease or purchase, um, negotiate over how many spots that you want to have included. So it may be possible to put more bedrooms, you can get more spots that you would be purchasing. It's still, they're still being treated differently. So I, I've said my piece, I, I won't repeat myself. Um, I've, I'm not comfortable with this recommendation. I think we are treating tenants differently than we treat homeowners, and I, I don't think that's fair. Um, so, but I, uh, I've said my piece. Just, just to be clear, um, 48R and 40B have owners as well as renters. So it's not just simply renters, it's owners and renters in those projects. Okay. okay. Noted. Uh, any other discussion? Well, I wish you hadn't spoke up because now it's complicated. <laughs> I, I, I guess <laughs> no. I, I still view it differently also because allowing this changes the teeth of the requirement of parking to be provided by the builder. So if we're saying, hey, you have to have one and a quarter, but you know what? They can get spots, spots on the street, so don't worry about it. I don't think that's okay. Uh, I don't think it quite works that way. Uh, I think it could very well work that way. Yeah. I don't think the developers of this particular building gave any concern to on-street parking based off of what their... I don't think they were uh, knowledgeable in our parking permit. Uh, I would agree. But I don't want to attempt to, to bring it up. And then that become a way that in future developments, people are saying, you don't really need to worry about that parking provision. Just well, we don't we don't allow overnight parking for five months out of the year anyway, so it can't really be used. Uh, I mean, I could lie, but it can't be used as a legitimate selling point because we don't allow on street parking. So if you're a resident, you know, your parking is what you get. Yeah, I mean, I think I said my piece too. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, is is just one more question? Is it isn't the ratio fixed? F well, no, I think the ratio is fixed, right? Depending Where on the R, it's fixed at one point two five. Yeah, that's for um, owner renter spaces, not mm -hmm. guests. That's negotiable. Okay. And then for forty B, there's no such thing. It's so whatever you discuss. Right. So and and given that a forty B could. It's it, it 
you know, from what I've read uh, or what I've tried to read up on 40B, if they could agree to a certain amount of parking um, and then not put that amount of parking in and appeal um, the right. permit and get the permit changed. Yeah. So, and that would be a driving factor. Um, you know, if they said we can park in the street, you know, we're going to have them park in the street. Yeah, you know, I don't think we want to go there. Yeah. Um, no, I, I know what you're saying, but I think our fear is that we're like, let's say the Meadows or anything. It would only be four houses there, so you'd have four families with three stickers, and now you're having 150 people with three stickers. So I think that's just our fear, the sheer number of units in these buildings. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I appreciate that, yeah, distinction, yeah. Um, <laughs> all right, if we're ready for the vote. Okay. No. Uh, wait, this is a hearing. Close. So we'll close the hearing. Any other comments? Hi. <laughs> we, we lost all our people. Um, all right. Uh, so hang on. So we need. Uh, whoops. So there's. A special motion to close the hearing. No. Uh, go ahead. Move that the select board uh, close the hearing. Is there a second? I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. Great. Uh, all right, so we have two motions here, one for each uh, suggested amended article. Do you want me to read yes, them? Please. Okay, so amendment number 2019-12, date filed December 3, 2019. That's what I'm looking at, or do you want just the motions? Simple, Simple motions. motions. Okay, simpler. Move the Select Board Approved Safety Amendment 2019-12 as presented. Is there a second? I'll second it. All those in favor? Opposed? Well, this is problematic. <laughs> Move that the select board approves. Oh, uh, sorry, I stole your thunder. My bad. Um, all right. Move the select board approve safety amendment twenty nineteen dash thirteen as presented. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. Uh, so. Well. So sorry. glad we cleared that up for you. Yeah. Um, we can choose to revisit this once we have a full board. Yeah. Um, so. Um, well, and, and it's properly noticed. Yes. So I'll, I'll leave that to you. Feel okay. free to add as uh, appropriate to the agenda so John can head to state and we can break the time. Okay. Uh, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thanks. Sorry, we we're so indecisive. Oh no, it's hard. It's All right, so we've done the minutes. Um, so. One of the things that we were talking about earlier in the evening was the Met. Yes. Uh, and Andy, you had mentioned something about the gas leaks meetings that I wanted to revisit. Mm -hmm. I sort of tabled that to the end. Mm -hmm. um, so let's. Uh, yes, Bob. Just on the gas leaks, uh, Andy gave me a clue mm -hmm. tonight that might help, but I had an answer to David and him. Um, you have to be really careful meeting with vendors before you go through a procurement process. I was going to, I was going mm -hmm. to just ask him to table that yeah. until our procurement folks had a look at it. Yeah. The dollar price is important for that to go forward, so I just ask you to hold it right. still. No problem with you know the board saying Andy should go forward, but as I asked David, he was fine with it. Just yeah. don't do it right away. Okay. Great. Thanks for that clarification. That was actually the when Andy brought that up. I, I yeah. I, like I, procure. I, all right. Let's yeah. as long as as long as all procurement rules are followed. Yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. and that's great. Yeah. But, but I guess the question is, d d does the does the board want me to stay with this process, um, or or hang back? Essentially, as a the liaison, basically. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I'd like to be. Um, meet with David uh, and and town manager and in and, and observe how this is all developed so that um, I can really follow it and um, uh, and be fully informed on you know each this the phases and and uh, report back to the board yes as as, as a liaison of what's happening. E everything will be transparent um, to the extent that it can be, uh, you know, regarding contracts and procurement and stuff like that. But when, when I heard this, I mean, one of the things that, so there's sort of a couple things that concerned me about us attending what amount to staff meetings, which is that 
it, it feels like it's beyond the scope of our responsibilities. Um, you, know, you and I you know, put this on the warrant um, as an article. It passed by town meeting. Yeah. Uh, and at that stage, for any other article that gets passed, it is then handed to the town manager or appropriate personnel mm -hmm. um, to then implement um, that article. So it, one of the things that worries me for a moment is that it sets precedent about how deeply we as board members are involved in the day-to-day -day functioning of town issues, right? Once, now that it has passed and the funding was allocated, it becomes an operations, operations issue. Um, and that is clearly within Bob's domain. And so, as far as being informed, I think, in, in my view, it would be appropriate to say, you know, the resident coordinates with Bob if there are questions that arise um, that they want to raise it to you or me because we were more involved um, or, or you who are more knowledgeable on some of the more details of it, then that would be fine. Um, but I hesitate to have us attend because then it, it does set the example that once we pass something, we are there for all of these meetings, and I think that's practical. Um, and it's starting to tread into Bob's territory. So I would be inclined to communicate whatever is necessary to Bob and then hand it off to him. Yeah, I, I, I get your point. Um, and and I, I certainly think this would, I don't want to see, see this as a precedent setting issue. But I think this, this um, topic is, a little differs from from others in that um, that that I've been going to the um, multi-town gas initiative meetings. I've been discussing the details of this with David Zeke, um, and and so I've been sort of involved from the get-go. And I have I think I have some knowledge. Um, on the topic um, that that could be helpful and so I'd like to stay involved uh, to that extent um, but I think the question is to stay involved as a private citizen I don't think is any problem at all no issue as a representative of the board is a different question well, yeah it's an issue as a resident too because residents don't attend staff meetings right yeah and and I and I, you know the it wouldn't David Zeke is unique here I, yeah. I, Okay. Right. I mean, it would be the town manager. I wouldn't be meeting with uh, others. Although other towns, in, in you know, seem to th they find the best model is you know they have uh, select board members integrated with DPW, with town manager, um, with volunteer groups. So they find a, a multifaceted approach helpful. So this this wouldn't be unprecedented. I don't think. I mean, specific to the gas leaks. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Bob? Um, this is certainly different because it's not the typical business of town government, this issue, so we don't have in-house expertise. Mm -hmm. Maybe the better solution is, and I don't usually like to do this, but the town manager forms a working group and invites Andy. That way the board is not spoken, they not said, you know, you will be our representative. I just decide David and Andy and whoever else has the right expertise because I clearly don't have it and I don't think our staff has it. Yeah. That might be one way to do it differently. Yeah, I mean, I, that's fine. I mean, if, if you're comfortable with that, Bob, I think that's yeah. fine. I mean, I, my hesitation here is that I want to make sure we don't tread into the micromanaging territory. Yeah, yeah and, and the one thing I can't answer today is I don't know the procurement cross process we might have to go through. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happens after phase one. So, um, to be clear, you know, if I start a working group now, it's for something very specific that'll have to be outlined. Right. And it doesn't go beyond that because I don't know, you know, what the rules and regulations would be after that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think this first step, I don't know, I don't understand it as an expert, but I understand it from what David's told me. It's generally straightforward. However, if you're going to start going either RFP, RFQ, or contract route, which I think you have to, Mm -hmm. It does get into legal specifics and yeah. technicals. And, so and I would and rely I on you for that. that. Right. David does. Yeah. Okay. So um, that, that's, um, that's a great offer, Bob. But 
you know, on the flip side, I also don't want to circumvent the, circumvent the board by being assigned by the town manager to a working group. Um, so I, I, it's up to the board, but I just don't want to feel like I'm doing an end run or on on you all. I'm comfortable with that. With the that proposal. I'm fine with it too. Okay. Uh, so the other item was the Met and where we stand there. So, so we sort of started the discussion, but uh, it's, we received a message from the developer um, saying that someone had asked for, someone from the board had asked for a meeting with him. Um, I know that wasn't me. It wasn't me. Okay. I can clarify. Thank this you. is one of those open meeting law many person emails. Yes. Uh, Mark had indicated, I think it was yesterday or the day before, that he wanted a lot more interest. So I said, well, let me see what parties might be available and then I'll talk to Vanessa about adding this to an agenda. Okay. So then Gene reached out to the town council as well as the developer and that explains the first sentence. Uh -huh. Got it. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Um, because I, I know Andy and I had each been yeah. contacted, but I was just a little yeah. in the dark about some, just that came I was some of your board this. members had interest in this, and some specifically did not. Oh. So, I mean, I, I think at this point, you know, there's uh, the ZBA has this on their agenda, um, some edits, some, some um, amendments to the permit, the comprehensive permit for tomorrow. We're not clear on the details. Uh, a hearing has not been posted. I think at this point it's a discussion because of that. Bob, can you correct me? Yeah, can you verify? You know, it's such a highly legal area. I want to say it's listed as a discussion. I don't think that prohibits them from making a vote. I can look up. But if there's, there's two sections, is it material and less material, whatever those things are. Substantial. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, it's, if they decide whatever's on the table is a substantial change, they have to go through a different legal process, which does involve hearing and notification of rebutters. But this particular and discussion and vote of substantial and substantial doesn't require a hearing? No. It's, it's under topics of discussion, other business, 35 Lincoln Street proposed changes is how it's listed on their yeah, agenda. It, just, it doesn't give us any specifics about what the proposed changes are that are being requested. So at this point, given, so if the, depending on how the ZBA votes on these proposed changes, yeah. either if they vote to approve the changes to the permit, then this board has no standing to ask the developer anything because this is currently under the authority of the ZBA. I want to make that very clear. If the ZBA votes that they are substantial changes or they choose to postpone it for whatever reason, then that's a different conversation. Um, so I, I just, I want to make sure we stay in our swim lane here mm -hmm. because the ZBA is involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I sort of wasn't, I, I, I was, I, I agree, we have to stay out of the ZBA's business, you know, unless, mm -hmm. you know. But, um, so I was just thinking of this as uh, a, you know, a, a procedural issue for, from the town's point of view, non-ZBA, but from um, how the town operates to, I think it'd be good if the board in general had an idea, um, not just for this development, but for other developments, if, if they've had a history of not complying with, okay. with the comprehensive permit, if the, if the, um, if the town, the town meeting town hall, the, the uh, planning division, um, could re request or require the the um, the builder to give um, as built plans that can then be compared to the 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 approved plans or something like that. So, for example, the the number of uh, violations or, or or discrepancies from the permit comp permit that we've learned um, seem to have come from um, uh, f from some residents, um, at, at least from what I've seen. Uh, um, 
And this would be a way of taking that burden off the residents, number one, and um, and just asking for some uh, approved plans like we, we do for the concrete pours. I, I would, wouldn't see this as any different. Um, and so that it would be, we'd have a transparent process of what's been changed and the board would be aware of that. And it, it would also like a, not necessarily for us to have the plans because I, I think I speak for everyone when I say not very few of us could actually read those plans accurately. No, um, no. but um, to understand to have a report perhaps from staff to so that they they the staff being the experts could provide us with information on discrepancies. Right, and, and get, I, so my my question was, can we uh, can the 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 Town uh, required this. I, I have I have swim lane concerns here. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, a um, couple things. Uh, one, we have swim lanes to observe also, and a 40B is very different from any other development that we see. Yeah. For anything but a 40B, we can do what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. For 40B, we cannot. We've mm -hmm. heard the complaints and the concerns of residents. The building commissioner, he's the only one that can do it, looked at the plan and said, you know, you're right. Some of these things are not what was planned. Mm -hmm. You don't get your CO until someone tells me I can give it to you. I can't do anything. Gene can't do anything. He can only listen to the ZBA. That's 40B. So all the things you suggested could rightly go as a resident into the ZBA as suggestions, but I can't do anything and staff can't do anything. So staff can't do anything unless a resident brings it to their attention. Unless ZBA tells us to for a 40B. Only for a 40B. Very so different legal. So I think there's 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 two things here that are happening in parallel. One is procedurally how staff in general handles making sure that developers are meeting the permit, the mm -hmm. comprehensive permit. That's item one. And the second is what's happening specifically with this particular development um, and, and how we can choose to handle that. Um, so I just I want to make sure we split these. Um, I guess my confusion comes in when you know we had an earlier meeting this year, within the past year, where they had built, um, they had did, did a concrete pour that was too close to the street, and that was not in keeping with the comp permit, mm -hmm. and <coughs> we didn't. That wasn't caught until after the building was four stories mm -hmm. high, and and Gene came in and said, you know, this is how we're going to fix this moving forward. We're going to require these um, uh, certified pl plans so that we can compare them and not allow them to build above um, uh -huh. concrete. So I assumed that that, that was a fix for all, all developments. It wasn't specified that it was everything but 40 Bs. So in other words... That part is. And I, Gene drove me down and showed me as soon as they put in the uh, pavement that it wasn't the plan and that that was communicated to them. Again, a developer under 40B does not have to listen at all. The only leverage we have and we happen to have at this point in time is we have the CFO that he wants. So the building commissioner can deny that mm -hmm. until the ZBA requires otherwise. Right. If for some reason we hadn't noticed and the CO of all was issued, the town has no leverage. So it can still go through the ZBA process. Right. But it, it's important to almost drop a lot of common sense at the door, if you will, respectfully of a 40B, because yeah. there are no rules. However, the, the ZBA could choose to deny them Absolutely. the exceptions. Absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 my question is not about the ZBA. My, the, my confusion is that that we, you know, Gene presented this process that we'll use moving forward to get plans of the concrete pour, and then you can't stop a developer from doing something not on the plan until you see him doing it, and the thing they paved was done in one day. But Gene, Gene said before allowing them to continue with construction, we would require we're requiring these concrete pour plans. I, Again, do you, they're, they're yeah. doing something that's not in a plan. How could we stop that? Once they've made the concrete pour, it was explained that we can stop them from building above ground level if they're not if they're so concrete they, pour plans. They're supposed to have a landscaped area. 
No, I'm not talking about that. But that's the issue. That's no, there are the number. Right now. There are a number of issues. I, I guess. I, I think. I yeah. think what you're asking for, Andy. Correct me if I'm wrong here. Yeah. Is um, essentially a, a way of having a check and balance. So. Gene's proposal for the concrete pour that you're talking about right. was in order for the developer to advance to the next stage, they are required to submit that plan, right. which they, then are they able to overlap with the original plan and see if there's any discrepancy so that it can be addressed earlier in the stage as opposed to six months later when there's four, it's four stories tall. Um, I think what you're asking is are there additional checks we can put in place to ensure that they are in compliance? Now, the, the thing that they've done, though, is that some of these things are relatively minor, and yet they're a major nuisance. And so we yeah. can't possibly have a check for every single thing that they're required to do. So how do we then, what tools do we have at our disposal to first ensure compliance, mm -hmm. and second, address them when they don't comply? And that is one of the things that I feel we're missing at this point. Yeah. But There's four times when the town has a tool for, for a project like this, the demolition permit, the foundation permit, the construction permit, and the certificate of occupancy. And we've had problems at all of those levels. Um, I believe so. Mm -hmm. but, but the point is, if something, if they don't need something from us, we have no teeth to go after them. When they need something, then we can say, aha, now we have a point of a check and a balance and a system to use. In between, if we catch them doing something that's not to plan, we can mention it to them. And then the only thing we can do other than have discussions and have loud discussions is say, you know, when you come back to us looking for that next step, it's not going to happen. You're going to have to go to the ZBA. We don't have any other, I mean, we can have discussions with people and, you know, they can be agreeable or disagreeable. But we don't have a lot of legal mechanisms in this process to say, all right, stop. And I, I think part of it is, is not necessarily about saying, all right, stop, because this particular 40 b is unique. We have not had, in, in, in my time in the last few years of, of watching these developments go up, have had nearly the headaches with other 40 bs that we have had with this one. We don't have 40 bs typically. We have 40 Rs or other. So... 40 b is un, unusual for us. So, but we have others in various stages that have been more collaborative with neighbors. Certainly the Eden Lake View has been. Um, but they've not actually done anything on the site yet. <laughs> so. True. But, but they've been very, they've been willing to meet with them significantly in, in the lead up to the development of the project. So. So let's carry it forward. Go for These it. folks are now willing to meet with us. And I think we should take advantage of it. And I think we should chat with them. And they seem uh, very proud of, of what they're doing, and at least the letter indicates that they want to have a good relationship. And it, it, it may be that this is a carrot, not a stick uh, resolution that takes place here. And I think it's worth having the discussion. It, it strikes me that everything we're talking about is owned by the ZBA, yeah. not but, us. But then why did we, we had a discussion in this very room, I remember, about the concrete pour. We'd catch it sooner. And, that's and, that's and what would have Yeah, so the plan was that we require of uh, of developments, and it wasn't specified, but not 40 Bs, um, if we can require a certified plan of the concrete pour before we allow them to go to the next level, why can't we require them to submit as built before we give them a certificate of occupancy? I think we probably can, but at the end of the day... But Bob's saying we cannot. I, I think we could... If I, the if same I'm way correct. that... It, it sounds to me like this is process, right? The same way that we're going to require the concrete pour descriptions or you know, whatever mm -hmm. schematics you want, etc. We can require them. It would allow us to catch something that's not on plan sooner. But Bob's saying we cannot do that. Well, we're doing it per what Gene discussed. We're going to do that for our process. I'm sure we can change this process too. And, and again, I think what it does is it catches issues earlier. We can yeah. catch it. We might then have the. I, I, I get all of that. To, to but like but we don't have. Sanction. Let's say we, we withhold the permit. Yeah. They, we, they go to ZBA. Yeah. Let's say we don't withhold the permit. And, and there's an issue. Yeah. They go to ZBA. Yeah. I'm the not, outcome doesn't change. I'm not talking about ZBA. 
I'm, I'm simply asking whether we can require the same thing about the concrete pour before we give permission to go further with the project. Can we do the same thing for as-builts before we give the certificate of occupancy? And you say yes, but I'm getting mixed messages here. If they did want to comply, they go to the ZBA, right? Yeah, I mean, and you've posed it to me at least, uh, yeah. specifically for this project, and that's how I've answered you. Yeah. If you're now asking a more general question for general projects, there's, there's an answer. Of course the town can step in and ask for things. But for this project, and with this stage is in, it's, it's not our swim lane and it's not yours. And those have been my answers. We're specifically project oriented. So, when we discuss this project specifically um, and the concrete pour, Gene's solution was for every other project, but not not for 40 Bs. Not for this one. It had already happened. I yes. To other clarify, projects. hold on. Yeah. But Gene's process will work future 40 Bs. Correct. Thank you. So to catch it's just it's, it's to catch it, right? But yeah. we can't do anything about what they did with this one. Um, I agree. And I, but, 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 but for forward, for future ones, it does a, a Gene's concrete pour plan procedure will apply to 40 Bs as well as other developments. They don't have the certificate of occupancy. Is that true as well as other? I thought you said it was only 40 Bs for the concrete um, pour. She can do that for 40 Bs as well but, as others. As well as others. Not as well. But. So In I think others are under the authority of the CPDC, so right. it's a little bit different. Yeah, but my point is that we can. Why can't we do the same thing before issuing? We have the certificate of occupancy that would need to be issued to them. Why can't, like the concrete pour plan, and let it go to the next step? Why can't we see the as built so we know? What what they've changed so, um, before we give them a certificate and by of we, occupancy? Do you mean us or the staff? Uh, yeah, the staff. if the if, if the, the staff can do that. Um, but it wouldn't necessarily be the ZBA, right? Because the the whole point is that the the building inspector is the one who gives the certificate of occupancy. Well, at this point, again, he shut down the CBO right uh, until they comply. Now they can skip the ZBA process entirely and do what he says, which is here's the plans, do what it says. Um, they've chosen not to, I think, and at least going to have a discussion with ZBA and we'll see what happens. But we can't, we can't require this developer, which the questions you've asked, mm -hmm. to do any of these things you've mentioned. Provide these plans? No. As built plans? It's, it's up to, the, it's in the ZBA's hands right now. But wasn't it in the ZBA's hands for the concrete pour? Yes, and what Gene suggested was not for this project, was for other projects. Including 40Bs? Including other 40Bs. Other 40Bs. Yeah, I, I guess. I, I think yeah. this is this is. Uh, are, are you asking for this project or for a future for this, so this and is, this and future? So so we didn't catch the concrete pour and and they they built it up, but we know now that in hindsight that could have been fixed by requiring concrete certified concrete pour pour plans. I don't understand why the 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 building inspector can. Uh, say, you know, in order to get your um, certificate of occupancy, um, uh, please present your as-built plans so I can take a look and see if it matches um, what's in the comprehensive permit. So actually, this brings up a good point, right? So there's a couple things that have been flagged, but they've been flagged by residents, right? And and based on that information, no, the building inspector... No, staff has noticed. Staff has noticed. Okay, Absolutely. Great. So I think Andy's point is, jump in here if I'm wrong, which is that it is possible that there are other changes that the developer made so that the as-built plans and the original comprehensive permit are different that perhaps haven't been flagged yet. So to Andy's point... I, I think at this point staff has been through these documents thoroughly and there is no such other thing. That I can say for sure. So, so the answer to the email from the resident about bollard lightings and uh, lighting for the sidewalks. And, and Mark Dupel, the building commissioner, have been through that document, stem to stern. And, if through the... Through the email, through the plan that was submitted, yeah. through what has actually happened, and has a full accounting of that for the ZBA tomorrow night. What the ZBA determines is, again, substantial or insubstantial, I guess the word is, is up to them. 
what the building commission says. All I know is it's not what you said you were going to do. I got to stop it. And we don't know what changes they're requesting. No. Well, we, I don't know. I'm sure the building commission knows. I'm sure the ZBA knows. Okay. Now, will they come in and have a different discussion tomorrow night? I can't say. I don't, I don't know for sure how that works. All right, so as far as how we want to handle next steps, um, it's in the ZBA's hands, and I think we need to see how that process plays out. I was not implying that we interfere with the ZBA. Oh, agreed, agreed. And I, I think as far as what actions we as a board can take, yeah. the answer is at this point is no. Yeah, I don't get the logic, but that's fine. A question about, uh, why well, I understand that in, in this with this particular development, the certificate of occupancy has been withheld pending um, either compliance or uh, granting of a variance by the by the ZBA. So, um, was that you know we d we didn't have the as built the, the building inspector didn't have the as built plans, but um, as you said, Bob, there there's no everything is now known in terms of how it's. Yeah, and I don't want to agree that they don't have the as built. I don't know what they do and don't have. I'm not okay. the expert at that. But I, know, I know they feel they have all the information they need for a ZBA to be presented to. Um, is it, I was in other contexts um, or with other developments, um, has is the same kind of review, are you confident that the same kind of review is undertaken in terms of the granting or withholding of a certificate of occupancy such that there wouldn't be um, anything missed in terms of what was in compliance or not in compliance? Yeah, generally speaking, I mean, yeah. um, for things you can see, uh, that's pretty easy, such as paving over where there should have been landscape. Right, right. Uh, for something behind a wall, well, but we have right. inspectors that work with them all you know, along the way mm -hmm. and then do get as built along the way of the building. Landscaping being different, we usually get an as built landscape. So again, you're getting into a technical area that I know some about, but I don't want to sure. step out of my lane either. So one of the things that now has come up, and the reason we're talking about it now, is the developer has reached out and said, we understand the board wants to meet. Is that something, and is that something that we want to post and have multiple of us, a quorum of us attend, or is it something where one or two of us are assigned to meet with the developer, have a conversation about the issues that we've been dealing with, and address it that way. I've met with the developer in the past, yes, as I you have, have. Yeah. And, and, and I was given promises and assurances mm -hmm. that were not fulfilled. So mm -hmm. I don't, um, like, I, you know, I feel I have, um, if, if we can't require as built to see what the differences are and get a handle on that. That's where that's just where the truth is, not what people you know. He said, she said, all that. Mm -hmm. um, if if uh, we can't ask for that, like we can concrete pours, then uh, they'll do what they want to do, and, and and you know we won't get any information on it. So uh, I guess I'm more both fatalistic and opportunistic about this. Fatalistic is there's not much we can do in control of what's happening here. At the same time, we have some very upset residents who are peppering emails and other things in our direction, indicating their discomfort, right? I think that we've got a developer who is willing to have a, a chat. I most definitely would not restrict it to these two issues that are going on. I would hope it's more of a relationship with the board in general, which we should have with all the different developments in town. And there have been some specific issues where I, I think there are at least some of us who feel promises were made and, and not carried forward. And I think that that's open to the discussion, but I, I would hope that their view is to kind of, you know, how, how where we are, we are, how, how can we kind of um, build a better relationship because it's a strained relationship. So might I suggest, I know Andy, you've had previous conversations with them. Um, I, I've had some, a couple as well, but it, Mark is fairly new to this conversation. Um, would the board feel comfortable with Mark and I meeting with the developer? I don't know. I think if we want to meet with the developer, we should do it as a whole board and it should be public. I 
I think that would be a less fruitful conversation. I'm just going to be honest. It would be a transparent one. Which isn't helpful if it doesn't get us anywhere. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that... And we've had, we've had them here. Yeah. Multiple yeah, with the, times. With the specific issues, those can actually be addressed at a public meeting at the ZBA. Yeah, I think that's, a, that's also a, a, a problem. It's a, that is precedent setting. That they, they've, they've had a liaison uh, for the project. I've done my best to address residents' mm -hmm. concerns. And really, when it, at the end of the day, it comes down to the residents. And they're someone who will look out for their investments in their homes, which is probably the biggest investment they have. And that's how I've come at this. Um, so if uh, if the, the, the board decides that, um, okay, you, um, you can get a different liaison, essentially, um, that's maybe more open uh, or yeah, you can choose your liaison. I, I, I don't think, I, I don't we're, we're think that's a good anymore. No, <laughs> I think I we're mean, stuck in a rut. I mean, look, we, we have the opportunity to speak to the developer. They re he re he's reached out to us. I say we take it. it. But he's willing to meet with the entire board. That would allow citizens, residents, to come and speak their mind, which they should be able to. They can do it at ZBA. Does, public that, hearing. does the process allow for that? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 But so we we also it. represent those residents and their interests. And, and but, but the problem is we don't have standing. I think that's the reality. That's that's the conclusion I'm, I'm coming to. We don't have standing here. So then, no? then how will we get more standing if we do relationship at building with a developer who has demonstrated a couple of times um, to really change the, what what was in the plan, what was agreed to. Not our purview, unfortunately. That's the drag, so and that's right. the problem. So the, we, we can we can listen and yeah. and do nothing else. Yeah. That's the problem. So the, the, there are a couple things that I think are really concerning. One is that um, if the process allows for the ZBA not to post publicly kind of all the things that are going on in advance and make a decision you know, that could have a big impact, that, that doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem like that's the way the process should work. So I, would, I wonder if that's actually right. Um, and if it is, we should kind of see what's going on. The other thing, and, and Anne, I'm, I'm gonna lean on you on this one. I know that Bob said we haven't had a lot of, of 40Bs playing through here. Our observations, my observation of Wakefield with 40Bs, I don't know if they've had more experience or not, but they had, they, had some different experiences and seemed to be working in different ways. Um, casual observation. They it, certainly, I feel like, brought, put the developer through, you know, come back to us with revise the plans in this way, revise the plan in this way, in that way, and they, you know, they're, they were continuously tweaking the project to... Um, yeah, maybe they have more 40B experience or whatever, but maybe it could uh, be helpful to us. Yeah, um, just bear in mind, that's what happened with this project and the ZBA a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. It was lots of meetings. It happened yeah. over many, many months. Lots mm -hmm. of back and forth come back. So I don't know if Wakefield's doing it much differently than us. I can't yeah. say. But just so you know, that did yeah. happen. So, so it may be that that's how it goes in the beginning, and then right. you get down to the practicality of it and things go out the window. So... It Okay. Is it from the um, the as the the question about the as built plan seems like it's probably because this is the because the Lincoln Prescott um, uh, question is before the ZBA tomorrow. It sounds like the at and, and the certificate of occupancy has been withheld. Yes. Yeah. It sounds like the question of whether as built plans should be requested. Uh, or, or required um, prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy, maybe more, more relevant when we're talking about um, future 40, 40B projects um, or when the before something is, is, is issued because it seems like in this case, the certificate of occupancy has been withheld. Um, that, that issues and have been flagged and that the certificate has been withheld. Are you concerned that they're going to be, that could be um, in this case issued, but we won't really know what's, what's happening? Yes. Okay. 
but I, I think that's I think the die is cast here. Okay. So I'll, uh, I'll but, give but, it. but I wonder actually though for future um, 40 beasts and that that the question of the as built plans if it would be it would be if it would be useful to hear from the building inspector as to whether that would be helpful to do the, that comparison and to flag those issues. I see Bob nodding his head. So yeah, I would think so. He's the expert. Yeah. yeah. Um, so back to so that's the as built permit um, relative to issuing the occupancy permit. We still have the question before us of whether or not we speak with the developer. I think we should pursue that because, well, really there's nothing to lose. Yeah. Possibly um, things to gain. Uh, again, they've offered to meet with the board and, and um, I, you know, I think we should meet with them as a board. But what if we do that, and then if it seems like more follow-up is required, we could designate a liaison, or not designate, or <laughs> maybe we won't <laughs> tap anyone yeah, to do so formally. Another, we, we another could, working group. We could we could take we could meet uh, we could invite them. Uh, to come before the board and then there's a time to be additional here which is that the ZBA meets tomorrow right even if they continue it I don't know if they continue it until December or if they continue it until January I don't know when they were hoping to occupy the building so any discussion that happens with the developer needs to happen very quickly the next ZBA meetings December 18th and there is room on their agenda I can't say what they will or won't do though I mean I don't I don't think it would really make sense for us I, I don't think we should meet any of us Personally, I don't think any of us should meet with a developer before they go before the ZBA. I don't think that that would be. I don't think that's possible anyway. Yeah, that's possible or really appropriate because there is this, you know, in terms of um, um, sensitivities about lanes. I mean, the Z, there is this. This is before the ZBA tomorrow. I don't think it would be appropriate for us to insert ourselves in meeting with the developer before before that takes place. But, but I wouldn't be able to anyway. I don't, yeah. I don't know about you. Nope. Um, so, okay, um, I think we've beaten this dead horse. Uh, are we comfortable with waiting to see what the ZBA does tomorrow night? Uh, and then based off of that, either decision or continuance, um, Andy, are you comfortable with Mark and I reaching out to the developer and sort of seeing if we can negotiate something. As I said, my preference would be if we want to meet, if they want to meet with the board, they meet with the board. Negotiations, uh, you have no negotiating power. Yeah, I don't think it's you've a said. negotiation. Um, okay, I don't, know what that, I don't know what that means. Okay, yeah. so discussion. I mean, I, 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 we understand we don't have leverage, mm -hmm. but a conversation is better than nothing, right? I mean, if we do yeah. nothing, yeah, I, I, I guess our hands I, I, I think that if the focus of the, the conversation is specific to these two issues, there's no reason to do it. There's no value. Right, and, and with nothing we can do, there's no reason for them to we, we, to do anything. Yeah, I, 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 I don't, that's not, I guess we, my, my concern was that, again, we have residents that have expressed a lot of concerns. Um, it is in ZBA's territory. They need to kind of go through the specifics of that. How we work with ZBA in any way, shape, or form is an interesting question, particularly as it relates to different kinds of projects. Maybe that's a discussion we want to have at some point with the ZBA also. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that'd be great. Yeah. Um, and to, specific we, to this developer, though, I think that there, there, I, there are big There is something. Group in town. There, there <laughs> is something. Um, we do somewhat have a point of leverage. Um, I am hesitant to say it now. Um, it's not necessarily anything that would there is a talking point we could use. But doing it in an open meeting is not. Uh, I, I don't, I think that would backfire. My concern is to, to create a forum that can't result in any action doesn't make any sense. But it might result in action. I, I'm saying that a public meeting. 
Agreed. In, in Agreed. the entire board, I can't see how that. Yeah, I, I wouldn't suggest moving forward with the full board discussion. In any way, we, shape, or form. We've had them, and they haven't gone well. Yeah, um, I, I don't see that as valuable. Whereas, a private conversation may yield different results. I mean, it is a different board than the last time they came before the board. It's not going to go up. Yeah, I mean, pr previous, I remember they were in once before, and as I, if I recall, uh, John spoke to them about, um, I forget the specifics, and I don't want to speak for John, but he, he had some concerns that he expressed. Um, and it didn't yield any results. And, it didn't, and, and I, you know, the, the that's why, you know, I think if we, if, I think the ship sailed, I don't, I, uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't under respectfully. I don't understand why we couldn't have gotten the as builts like we could have gotten we're, the plan. We're past that, Andy. But if we don't, point, we because we don't have the, let me let me finish. The, if no, I may. Andy, we have we are moved past the as built at this yes. point. We need to determine if we are having a conversation with the developer. That's at this point. I mean, it's we've been talking about this for a half hour. Yeah. So. I are don't. we comfortable with a couple of members meeting with the developer or not? Because if, if we choose no, mm -hmm. and and history has demonstrated that a public meeting is unproductive, then what mm -hmm. we're saying is that all the complaints of the residents are going to be unaddressed. That we are essentially giving up in working with this developer. And that is not the kind of board I want to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my point is, I wasn't trying to revisit the as -builts. My point is, without the as -builts, I, I don't know uh, what kind of discussion you can have with them because uh, you don't know what they've done that's consistent and, and what they've done that's not consistent but where you could negotiate. The boss has already addressed that right. issue. The and staff has already looked into that portion of it. And we can't, we don't control it. Having it would be helpful, I would imagine, to the ZBA, certainly the building inspector, many yeah. of these and things they may would, have it. but we it, don't, we don't unfortunately, there's not much we can do formally, mm -hmm. and I would try informally. And, and so, um, my opinion. Are, are you comfortable with Mark and I reaching out to the developer and just having a conversation with them? So I would say that I... I'm comfortable with any member of the select board reaching out to anyone ab about anything, but I don't know that, I think it does feel a little bit funny with Andy as the liaison to the project to have you do, for, to have the two of you do so at, as um, a, representing the board if Andy is our liaison to the project. So I feel like you should feel free to do so, but I wouldn't say that you are like, that you were doing so representing. I think in your own in your own personal capacities and in your own capacities as elected officials but not speaking for the board as a whole because I don't really know what I don't know what you have in mind for this mm -hmm. conversation so that's fair yeah okay. I, 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 I'm comfortable with that too so how do we respond you and I will respond separately okay okay uh, we have gone through our agenda and not then completely. some uh, so what? Do we have, do we so, have a motion to adjourn? No. I have one more topic I want to talk about that's on future uh, agendas. Well, we just spent well over 45 minutes on this, actually closer to an hour, just as an FYI. Um, talk fast. <laughs> What's up? I think that the issue that the chief brought up, the uh, fire chief brought up, is very important in terms of occupancy issues, and it may be more holiday specific or special event specific or something like that and I would I know we talked about throwing it to a future agenda this is an example of where I'd like to throw it to a specific agenda set a time to do it as opposed to kind of just sometime we'll get mm -hmm. to it so I would suggest that it, it may be a good if there's an issue like this that may come up again around the holidays later in the month then I'd suggest we address it before that if that's not so much an issue then I think we ought to hit it in January so uh, Mark, I think that I think that's a great topic that you brought up, um, Bob. Given this sensitivity, um, especially around fires, is there something that we, as the board, can be helpful to you in supporting those efforts to enforce occupancy limits, uh, or is this something that 
the staff would like to sort of take a stab at first. So I really, as I mentioned earlier, it's it's an unusual issue. We really need legal advice first. I can't okay. honestly answer your question. Okay. I so, Mark, would you feel comfortable with letting Bob take the lead on this one, and then, as he sees fit, put it in front of us at the most relevant agenda that works for him and legal counsel? Yeah. You, could I just suggest that let's assume it's January, unless one we hear something different from legal and two if the chiefs indicate that there's an issue still later in this year yeah. then i think we ought to get ahead of it not behind it in other I'm, words I'm if it's going to come up in late so december january february just that's, that's fine yep. that's fine yep that's fine do you know if, in your court. Yep. All right. if we can bob do you know if we if we have to renew uh alcohol licenses is is it like but Once you they have, have yes. them in the month of December, yeah, have, right? Yes. Yeah. But if we do, you know, are we? Is there some sort of expectation or obligation, legal obligation, that we would have to renew it for a certain establishment? If you, know, like you if don't they, renew, they no longer have a liquor license. Right. And and they will take legal action. And they will take Not legal action. Yeah. No, we we have to renew. Yeah. Right. And I think we can't hold up. Other people's licenses right. for no, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm not suggesting that. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. But this does worry me, as, as you mark. Um, I would also, Vanessa, if if I may, um, I was hoping that we could have on a future agenda, maybe January, February, um, discuss a discussion of some of the instructional motions passed by town meeting you know considering making this a green community um um i'm gonna say i'm gonna suggest that yeah, we put others. any i'm gonna put something like a green community on mm -hmm. the retreat agenda okay uh, and maybe we make a retreat maybe we <laughs> Maybe we make the retreat agenda a, a standing one where it's a quarterly meeting or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. Does that work for you? Yeah. Great. Uh, okay. Perfect. Now, can we have a motion to adjourn? One. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> um, several people asked tonight in public comment if we could put mm -hmm. the. Um, yeah. Yeah, software. Bob, so. Bob has it on the list. Okay. okay. Yeah, thank you. The, the, I have the a big list from tonight. Okay, great. Uh, okay. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Thank you. Wait, we didn't have a discussion.